Section 27 of the Story of King Arthur and His Knights. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Dominic Trace. Part 2. The Story of Sir Pelleas. Here followeth the story of Sir Pelleas, surnamed by many the Gentle Knight. For Sir Pelleas was of such a sort that it was said of him that all women loved him without disadvantage to themselves, and that all men loved him to their great good advantage. Wherefore, when in the end he won for his beloved that beautiful lady of the lake, who was one of the chiefest damsels of fairy, and when he went to dwell as Lord Paramount in that wonderful habitation which no other mortal than he and Sir Launcelot of the lake had ever beheld, then were all men rejoiced at his great good fortune. Albeit all the court of King Arthur grieved that he had departed so far away from them never to return again. So I believe that you will have pleasure in reading the history of the things concerning Sir Pelleas hereinafter written for your edification. Chapter First How Queen Guinevere went a maying, and of how Sir Pelleas took upon him a quest in her behalf. Now it befell upon a pleasant day in the springtime that Queen Guinevere went a maying with a goodly company of knights and ladies of her court. And among those knights were Sir Pelleas, and Sir Geraint, and Sir Dinadan, and Sir Aglevel, and Sir Agravaine, and Sir Constantine of Cornwall, and sundry others, so that the like of that court was hardly to be found in all of the world, either then or before or since. The day was exceedingly pleasant, with the sunlight all yellow, like to gold, and the breeze both soft and gentle. The small birds they sang with very great joy, and all about there bloomed so many flowers of diverse sorts that the entire meadows were carpeted with their tender green. So it seemed to Queen Guinevere that it was very good to be abroad in the field and beneath the sky at such a season. Now as the queen and her court walked in great joy among the blossoms, one of the damsels attendant upon the Lady Guinevere cried out of a sudden, Look, look, who is that cometh yonder? Thereupon Queen Guinevere lifted up her eyes, and she beheld that there came across the meadows a damsel riding upon a milk-white palfrey, accompanied by three pages clad in sky-blue raiment. That damsel was also clad entirely in azure, and she wore a finely wrought chain of gold about her neck and a fillet of gold about her brows. And her hair, which was as yellow as gold, was wrapped all about with bands of blue ribbon embroidered with gold and one of the pages that followed the damsel bare a square frame of no very great size, and to that the frame was enveloped and covered with a curtain of crimson satin. Now when the queen beheld that goodly company approaching, she bade one of the knights attendant upon her to go forth to meet the damsel, and the knight who went forth in obedience to her command was Sir Pelleas. So when Sir Pelleas met the damsel and her three pages, he spake to her in this wise, Fair damsel, I am commanded by yonder lady for to greet you and to crave of you the favor of your name and purpose. Sir Knight, said the damsel, I do perceive from your countenance and address that you are some lord of very high estate and of great nobility, wherefore I will gladly tell you that my name is Parsonet, and that I am a damsel belonging to the court of a certain very high dame who dwelleth at a considerable distance from here, and who is called the Lady Etterd of Grant Mesnel. Now I come hitherward desiring to be admitted into the presence of Queen Guinevere. Accordingly, if you can tell me whereabout I may find that noble lady, I shall assuredly be very greatly beholden unto you. Ha, lady, quoth Sir Pelleas, thou shalt not have very far to go to find Queen Guinevere, for behold, yonder she walketh, surrounded by her court of lords and ladies. Then the damsel said, I prithee bring me unto her. So Sir Pelleas led Parsonet unto the queen, and Queen Guinevere received her with great graciousness of demeanor, saying, Damsel, what is it that ye seek of us? Lady, quoth the damsel, I will tell you that very readily. The Lady Etterd, my mistress, is considered by all in those parts where she dwelleth to be the most beautiful lady in the world. Now of late there hath come such a report of your exceeding beauty that the Lady Etterd hath seen fit for to send me hitherward, to see with mine own eyes if that which is recorded of you is soothly true. And indeed, lady, now that I stand before you, I may not say but that you are the fairest dame that ever mine eyes beheld, unless it be the Lady Ettard aforesaid. Then Queen Guinevere laughed with very great mirth, and she said, It appears to me to be a very droll affair that thou shouldst have travelled so great a distance for so small a matter. Then she said, Tell me, damsel, what is it thy page beareth so carefully wrapped up in that curtain of crimson satin? Lady, quoth the damsel, 
It is a true and perfect likeness of the Lady Ettard, who is my mistress. Then Queen Guinevere said, Show it to me. Upon this the page who bore the picture dismounted from his palfrey, and coming to Queen Guinevere he kneeled down upon one knee, and uncovered the picture so that the queen and her court might look upon it. Thereupon they all beheld that the picture was painted very cunningly upon a panel of ivory framed with gold and inset with many jewels of diverse colors. And they saw that it was the picture of a lady of such extraordinary beauty that all they who beheld it marveled thereat. Hey, damsel, quoth Queen Guinevere, thy lady is indeed graced with wonderful beauty. Now if she doth in sooth resemble that picture, then I believe that her like to loveliness is not to be found anywhere in the world. Upon this Sir Pelias spake out and said, Not so, lady, for I do protest and am willing to maintain my words with the peril of my body that thou thyself art much more beautiful than that picture. Hey day, sir knight, quoth the damsel Parsonet, it is well that thou dost maintain that saying so far away from Grant Mesnel. For at that place is a certain knight, hight Sir Angamore of Malverat, who is a very strong knight indeed, and who maintaineth the contrary to thy saying in favor of the Lady Ettard, against all comers who dare to encounter him. Then Sir Pelias kneeled down before Queen Guinevere, and set his palms together. Lady, he said, I do pray thee of thy grace that thou wilt so far honor me as to accept me for thy true knight in this matter. For I would fain essay an adventure in thy behalf, if I have thy permission for to do so. Wherefore, if thou grantest me leave, I will straightway go forth to meet this knight of whom the damsel speaketh, and I greatly hope that when I find him I shall cause his overthrow to the increasing of thy glory and honor. Then Queen Guinevere laughed again with pure merriment. Sir, quoth she, it pleases me beyond measure that thou shouldst take so small a quarrel as this upon thee in my behalf. For if, so be, thou dost assume so small a quarrel, then how much more wouldst thou take a serious quarrel of mine upon thee? Wherefore I do accept thee very joyfully for my champion in this affair. So go thou presently, and arm thyself in such a way as may be fitting for this adventure. Lady, said Sir Pelias, if I have thy leave, I will enter into this affair clad as I am. For I entertain hopes that I shall succeed in winning armor and accoutrements upon the way. In which case this adventure will be still more to thy credit than it would otherwise be. At this the queen was very much pleased that her knight should undertake so serious an adventure clad only in holiday attire. Wherefore she said, Let it be as thou wouldst have it. Thereupon she bade her page, Florian, for to go fetch the best horse that he might obtain for Sir Pelias. And Florian, running with all speed, presently returned with a noble steed, so black of hue that I believe there was not a single white hair upon him. Then Sir Pelias gave adieu to Queen Guinevere and her merry May court, and they gave him adieu and great acclaim, and thereupon he mounted his horse and rode away with the damsel Parsonet and the three pages clad in blue. Now when these had gone some distance, the damsel Parsonet said, Sir, I know not thy name or thy condition, or who thou art. Unto this Sir Pelias said, Damsel, my name is Pelias, and I am a knight of King Arthur's round table. At that Parsonet was very much astonished, for Sir Pelias was held by many to be the best knight-at-arms alive, saving only King Arthur and King Pellinore. Wherefore she cried out, Messire, it will assuredly be a very great honor for Sir Angamore to have to do with so famous a knight as thou. Unto this Sir Pelias said, Damsel, I think there are several knights of King Arthur's round table who are better knights than I. But Parsonet said, I cannot believe that to be the case. Then after a while Parsonet said to Sir Pelias, Messire, how wilt thou get thyself armor for to fight Sir Angamore? Maiden, said Sir Pelias, I do not know at these present where I shall provide me armor, but before the time cometh for me to have to do with Sir Angamore, I have faith that I shall find armor fit for my purpose. For thou must know that it is not always the defense that a man weareth upon his body that bringeth him success, but more often it is the spirit that uplifteth him unto his undertakings. Then Parsonet said, Sir Pelias, I do not believe that it is often the case that a lady hath so good a knight as thou for to do battle in her behalf. To which Sir Pelias said very cheerfully, Damsel, when thy time cometh, I wish that thou mayest have a very much better knight to serve thee than I. Sir, quoth Parsonet, such a thing as that is not likely to befall me. At the which Sir Pelias laughed with great lightness of heart. Then Parsonet said, 
Hi ho, I would that I had a good knight for to serve me. To this Sir Pelias made very sober reply, Maiden, the first one that I catch I will give unto thee for thy very own. Now wouldst thou have him fair or dark, or short or tall? For if thou wouldst rather have him short and fair, I will let the tall dark one go. But if thou wouldst have him tall and dark, I will let go the other sort. Then Parsonet looked very steadily at Sir Pelias, and she said, I would have him about as tall as thou art, and with the same color of hair and eyes, and with a straight nose like unto thine, and with a good wit such as thou hast. Alas, said Sir Pelias, I would that thou hadst told me this before we had come so far from Camelot, for I could easily have got thee such a knight at that place. For they have them there in such plenty that they keep them in wicker cages and sell them for two a farthing. Whereat Parsonet laughed very cheerfully and said, Then Camelot must be a very wonderful place, Sir Pelias. So, with very merry discourse, they journeyed upon their way with great joy and good content, taking much pleasure in the springtime and the pleasant meadows whereon they travelled, being without care of any sort, and heart full of cheerfulness and good will. That night they abided at a very quaint, pleasant hostelry that stood at the outskirts of the forest of Usk, and the next morning they departed betimes in the freshness of the early day, quitting that place and entering into the forest shadows. Now, after they had travelled a considerable distance in that forest, the damsel Parsonet said to Sir Pelias, Sir, do you know what part of the wood this is? Nay, said Sir Pelias. Well, said Parsonet, this part of the woodland is sometimes called Eroy, and is sometimes called the Forest of Adventure. For I must tell you it is a very wonderful place, full of magic of sundry sorts. For it is said that no knight may enter into this forest, but some adventure shall befall him. Damsel, said Sir Pelias, that which thou tellest me is very good news. For maybe, if we should fall in with some adventure at this place, I may then be able to obtain armor suitable for my purpose. So they entered the forest of adventure forthwith, and then travelled therein for a long way, marvelling greatly at the aspect of that place into which they were come. For the forest was very dark and silent and wonderfully strange and altogether different from any other place that they had ever seen. Wherefore it appeared to them that it would not be at all singular if some extraordinary adventure should befall them. So after they had travelled in this wise for a considerable pass, they came of a sudden out of those thicker parts of the woodland to where there was an opening of considerable extent and there they beheld before them a violent stream of water that flowed very turbulently and with great uproar of many noises and they saw that by the side of the stream of water there was a thorn tree and that underneath the thorn tree was a bank of green moss and that upon the bank of moss there sat an aged woman of a very woeful appearance for that old woman was extraordinarily withered with age, and her eyes were all red as though with a continual weeping of rheum, and many bristles grew upon her cheeks and her chin, and her face was covered with such a multitude of wrinkles that there was not any place that was free from wrinkles. Now when that old woman beheld Sir Pelias and Parsonet and the three pages approaching where she sat, she cried out in a loud voice, Sir, wilt thou not bear me over this water upon thy horse? For, lo, I am very old and feeble, and may not cross this river by myself. Then Parsonet rebuked the old woman, saying, Peace, be still. Who art thou to ask this noble knight for to do thee such a service as that? Then Sir Pelias was not pleased with Parsonet, wherefore he said, Damsel, thou dost not speak properly in this matter. For that which beseemeth a true knight is to give succour unto any one soever who needeth his aid. For King Arthur is the perfect looking-glass of knighthood, and he hath taught his knights to give succour unto all who ask succour of them, without regarding their condition. So saying, Sir Pelias dismounted from his horse and lifted the old woman up upon the saddle thereof. Then he himself mounted once more and straightway rode into the ford of the river, and so came across the torrent with the old woman in safety to the other side. And Parsonet followed him, marvelling very greatly at his knightliness, and the three pages followed her. Now when they had reached the other side of the water, Sir Pelias dismounted with intent to aid the old woman to alight from the horse, but she waited not for his aid, but immediately leaped down very lightly from where she was. And lo! 
sir pelias beheld that she whom he had thought to be only an aged and withered beldam was in truth a very strange wonderful lady of extraordinary beauty and greatly marvelling he beheld that she was clad in apparel of such a sort as neither he nor any who were there had ever beheld before and because of her appearance he was aware that she was not like any ordinary mortal but that she was doubtless of enchantment for he perceived that her face was of a wonderful clearness like to ivory for whiteness and that her eyes were very black and extraordinarily bright like unto two jewels set into ivory and he perceived that she was clad all in green from head to foot and that her hair was long and perfectly black and like to fine silk for softness and for glossiness and he perceived that she had about her neck a collar of opal stones and emeralds inset into gold and that about her wrists were bracelets of finely wrought gold inset with opal stones and emeralds wherefore from all these circumstances he knew that she must be fay for thus was the lady nymu of the lake and so had she appeared unto king arthur and so did she appear unto sir pelias and those who were with him so beholding the wonderful magical quality of that lady sir pelias kneeled down before her and set his hands together palm to palm but the lady of the lake said sir why dost thou kneel to me lady quoth sir pelias because thou art so wonderfully strange and beautiful Messire, said the lady of the lake thou hast done a very good service to me and art assuredly a very excellent knight wherefore arise and kneel no longer so sir pelias arose from his knees and stood before her and he said lady who art thou to the which she made reply i am one who holdeth an exceedingly kind regard toward king arthur and all his knights my name is nymu and i am the chiefest of those ladies of the lake of whom thou mayest have heard tell i took upon me that form of a sorry old woman for to test thy knightliness and lo i have not found thee amiss in worthy service then sir pelias said lady thou hast assuredly done me great favour in these upon that the lady of the lake smiled upon sir pelias very kindly and she said sir i have a mind to do thee a greater favour than that therewith so saying she immediately took from about her neck that collar of opal stones of emeralds and gold and hung it about the shoulders of sir pelias so that it hung down upon his breast with a very wonderful glory of variegated colours keep this she said for it is a very potent magic upon that she vanished instantly from the sight of those who were there leaving them astonished and amazed beyond measure at what had befallen and sir pelias was like one who was in a dream for he wist not whether that which he had beheld was a vision or whether he had seen it with his waking eyes wherefore he mounted upon his horse in entire silence as though he knew not what he did and likewise in entire silence he led the way from that place nor did any of those others speak at that time only after they had gone a considerable distance parsonet said speaking in a manner of fear messire that was a very wonderful thing that befell us to which sir pelias said yea maiden now that necklace which the lady of the lake had hung about the neck of sir pelias possessed such a virtue that whosoever wore it was beloved of all those who looked upon him for the collar was enchanted with that peculiar virtue but sir pelias was altogether unaware of that circumstance wherefore he only took joy to himself because of the singular beauty of the jewel which the lady of the lake had given him End of section twenty seven Recording by Dominic Trice Section 28 of The Story of King Arthur and His Knights This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Dominic Trice Chapter 2nd How Sir Pelias Overcame a Red Knight Hight Sir Adrasac, and of how he liberated twenty two captives from that knight's castle. Now, after that wonderful happening, they journeyed continuously for a great while, nor did they pause at any place until they came, about an hour after the prime of the day, to a certain part of the forest where charcoal burners were plying their trade. Here Sir Pelias commanded that they should draw rein and rest for a while and so they dismounted for to rest and to refresh themselves as he had ordained that they should do now as they sat there refreshing themselves with meat and drink 
there came of a sudden from out of the forest a sound of great lamentation and of loud outcry and almost immediately there appeared from the thickets coming into that open place a lady in woeful array riding upon a pied palfrey and behind her rode a young esquire clad in colours of green and white and seated upon a sorrel horse and he also appeared to be possessed of great sorrow being in much disarray and very downcast of countenance and the lady's face was all beswollen and inflamed with weeping and her hair hung down upon her shoulders with neither net nor band for to stay it in place and her raiment was greatly torn by the brambles and much stained with forest travel and the young esquire who rode behind her came with a drooping head and a like woeful disarray of apparel his cloak dragging behind him and made fast to his shoulder by only a single point now when sir pelleas beheld the lady and the esquire in such sad estate he immediately rose from where he sat and went straight away to the lady and took her horse by the bridle and stayed it where it was and the lady looked at him yet saw him not being altogether blinded by her grief and distraction then sir pelleas said to her lady what ails thee that thou sorrowest so greatly whereunto she made reply sir it matters not for thou canst not help me how know ye that said sir pelleas i have a very good intention for to aid thee if it be possible for me to do so then the lady looked more narrowly at sir pelleas and she perceived him as though through a mist of sorrow and she beheld that he was not clad in armour but only in a holiday attire of fine crimson cloth wherefore she began sorrowing afresh and that in great measure for she deemed that here was one who could give her no aid in her trouble wherefore she said sir thy intentions are kind but how canst thou look to give me aid when thou hast neither arms nor defences for to help thee in taking upon thee such a quarrel but sir pelleas said lady i know not how i may aid thee until that thou tellest me of thy sorrow yet i have good hope that i may serve thee when i shall know who it is that causes thee such disorder of mind thereupon still holding the horse by the bridle he brought the lady forward to that place where parsonet still sat beside the napkin spread with food with which they had been refreshing themselves and when he had come to that place he with all gentleness constrained the lady for to dismount from her horse then with equal gentleness he compelled her to sit down upon the grass and to partake of the food and when she had done so and had drunk some of the wine she found herself to be greatly refreshed and began to take to herself more heart of grace thereupon beholding her so far recovered sir pelleas again demanded of her what was her trouble and besought her that she would open her heart unto him so being encouraged by his cheerful words she told to sir pelleas the trouble that had brought her to that pass sir knight she said the place where i dwell is a considerable distance from this thence i came this morning with a very good knight hight sir brandemere who is my husband we have been married but for a little over four weeks so that our happiness until this morning was as yet altogether fresh with us now this morning sir brandemere would take me out a-hunting at the break of day and so we went forth with a brachet of which my knight was wonderfully fond so coming to a certain place in the forest there started up of a sudden from before us a doe which same the brachet immediately pursued with great vehemence of outcry thereupon i and my lord and this esquire followed thereafter with very great spirit and enjoyment of the chase now when we had followed the doe and the hound for a great distance the hound pursuing the doe with a great passion of eagerness we came to a certain place where we beheld before us a violent stream of water which was crossed by a long and narrow bridge and we beheld that upon the other side of the stream there stood a strong castle with seven towers and that the castle was built up upon the rocks in such a way that the rocks and the castle appeared to be altogether like one rock now as we approached the bridge aforesaid lo the portcullis of the castle was lifted up and the drawbridge was let fall very suddenly and with a great noise and there immediately issued forth from out of the castle a knight clad altogether in red and all the trappings and the furniture of his horse were likewise of red and the spear which he bore in his hand was of ashwood painted red and he came forth very terribly and rode forward so that he presently stood at the other end of that narrow bridge thereupon he called aloud to sir brandemere my husband saying whither wouldst thou go sir knight 
and unto him sir brandemir made reply sir i would cross this bridge for my hound which i love exceedingly hath crossed here in pursuit of a doe then that red knight cried aloud in a loud voice sir knight thou comest not upon this bridge but at thy peril for this bridge belongeth unto me and whosoever would cross it must first overthrow me or else he may not cross now my husband sir brandemere was clad at that time only in a light raiment such as one might wear for hunting or for hawking only that he wore upon his head a light bassinet enwrapped with a scarf which i had given him Nevertheless, he was so great of heart that he would not abide any challenge such as that red knight had given unto him wherefore bidding me and this esquire whose name is ponteferet to remain upon the farther side of the bridge he drew his sword and rode forward to the middle of the bridge with intent to force a way across if he was able to do so whereupon seeing that to be his intent that red knight clad all in complete armour cast aside his spear and drew his sword and rode forward to meet my knight so they met in the middle of the bridge and when they had thus met that red knight lifted himself in his stirrup and smote my husband sir brandemere upon the crown of his bassinet with his sword and i beheld the blade of the red knight's sword that it cut through the bassinet of sir brandemere and deep into his brain pan so that the blood ran down upon the knight's face in great abundance then sir brandemere straightway fell down from his horse and lay as though he were gone dead having thus overthrown him that red knight dismounted from his horse and lifted up sir brandemere upon the horse whence he had fallen so that he lay across the saddle then taking both horses by the bridles the red knight led them straight back across the bridge and so into his castle and as soon as he had entered into the castle the portcullis thereof was immediately closed behind him and the drawbridge was raised nor did he pay any heed whatever either to me or to the esquire ponteferet but he departed leaving us without any word of cheer nor do i now know whether my husband sir brandemere is living or dead or what hath befallen him and as the lady spake these words lo the tears again fell down her face in great abundance then sir pelias was very much moved with compassion wherefore he said lady thy case is indeed one of exceeding sorrowfulness and i am greatly grieved for thee and indeed i would fain aid thee to all the extent that is in my power so if thou wilt lead me to where is this bridge and that grimly castle of which thou speakest i make thee my vow that i will assay to the best of my endeavour to learn of the whereabouts of thy good knight and as to what hath befallen him sir said the lady i am much beholden unto thee for thy good will yet thou mayest not hope for success shouldst thou venture to undertake so grave an adventure as that without either arms or armour for to defend thyself for consider how grievously that red knight hath served my husband sir brandemere taking no consideration as to his lack of arms or defence wherefore it is not likely that he will serve thee any more courteously and to the lady's words parsonet also lifted up a great voice bidding sir pelias not to be so unwise as to do this thing that he was minded to do and so did ponteferet the esquire also call out upon sir pelias that he should not do this thing but that he should at least take arms to himself ere he entered upon this adventure but to all that they said sir pelias replied stay me not in that which i would do for i do tell you all that i have several times undertaken adventures even more perilous than this and yet i have escaped with no great harm to myself nor would he listen to anything that the lady and the damsel might say but arising from that place he aided the lady and the damsel to mount their palfreys then mounting his own steed and the esquire and the pages having mounted their steeds the whole party immediately departed from that place so they journeyed for a great distance through the forest the esquire ponteferet directing them how to proceed in such a way as should bring them by and by to the castle of the red knight so at last they came to a more open place in that wilderness where was a steep and naked hill before them and when they had reached to the top of that hill they perceived beneath them a river very turbulent and violent likewise they saw that the river was spanned by a bridge exceedingly straight and narrow and that upon the farther side of the bridge and of the river there stood a very strong castle with seven tall towers moreover the castle and the towers were built up upon the rocks very lofty and high so that it was hard to tell where the rocks ceased and the walls began wherefore the towers and the walls appeared to be altogether one rock of stone then the esquire ponteferet 
pointed with his finger and said sir knight yonder is the castle of the red knight and into it he bare sir brandemir after he had been so grievously wounded then sir pelias said unto the lady lady i will presently inquire as to thy husband's welfare therewith he set spurs to his horse and rode down the hill toward the bridge with great boldness and when he had come nigher to the bridge lo the portcullis of the gate was lifted and the drawbridge was let fall with a great noise and tumult and straight away there issued forth from out of the castle a knight clad all in armour and accoutrements of red and this knight came forward with great speed toward the bridge's head then when sir pelias saw him approaching so threateningly he said unto those who had followed him down the hill stand fast where ye are and i will go forth to bespeak this knight and inquire into the matter of that injury which he hath done unto sir brandemir upon this the esquire ponteferet said unto him stay sir knight thou wilt be hurt but sir pelias said not so i shall not be hurt so he went forth very boldly upon the bridge and when the red knight saw him approach he said ha who art thou who darest to come thus upon my bridge unto him sir pelias made reply it matters not who i am but thou art to know thou discourteous knight that i have come to inquire of thee where thou hast disposed of that good knight sir brandemir and to ask of thee why thou didst entreat him so grievously a short time since at this the red knight fell very full of wrath ha ha he cried vehemently that thou shalt presently learn to thy great sorrow for as i have served him so shall i quickly serve thee so that in a little while i shall bring thee unto him then thou mayest ask him whatsoever thou dost list but seeing that thou art unarmed and without defence i would not do thee any bodily ill wherefore i demand of thee that thou shalt presently surrender thyself unto me otherwise it will be very greatly to thy pain and sorrow if thou compellest me to use force for to constrain thy surrender then sir pelias said what what would thou thus assail a knight who is altogether without arms or defence as i am and the red knight said assuredly i shall do so if thou dost not immediately yield thyself unto me then quoth pelias thou art not fit for to be dealt with as beseemeth a tried knight wherefore should i encounter thee thy overthrow must be of such a sort as may shame any belted knight who weareth golden spurs thereupon he cast about his eyes for a weapon to fit his purpose and he beheld how that a certain huge stone was loose upon the coping of the bridge now this stone was of such a size that five men of usual strength could hardly lift it but sir pelias lifted it forth from its place with great ease and raising it with both hands he ran quickly toward the red knight and flung the rock at him with much force and the stone smote the red knight upon the middle of the shield and drave it back upon his breast with great violence and the force of the blow drave the knight backward from his saddle so that he fell down to the earth from his horse with a terrible tumult and lay upon the bridgeway like one who was altogether dead and when they within the castle who looked forth therefrom saw that blow and when they beheld the overthrow of the red knight they lifted up their voices in great lamentation so that the outcry thereof was terrible to hear but sir pelias ran with all speed to the fallen knight and set his knee upon his breast and he unlaced the helmet and lifted it and he beheld that the face of the knight was strong and comely and that he was not altogether dead so when sir pelias saw that the red knight was not dead and when he perceived that he was about to recover his breath from the blow that he had suffered he drew that knight's misericordia from its sheath and set the point to his throat so that when the red knight awoke from his swoon he beheld death in the countenance of sir pelias and in the point of the dagger so when the red knight perceived how near death was to him he besought sir pelias for mercy saying spare my life unto me whereunto sir pelias said who art thou and the knight said i am hight sir adresac surnamed of the seven towers then sir pelias said to him what hast thou done unto sir brandemir and how doth it fare with that good knight and the red knight replied he is not so seriously wounded as you suppose now when sir brandemir's lady heard this speech she was greatly exalted with joy so that she smote her hands together making great cry of thanksgiving but sir pelias said now tell me sir adresac hast thou other captives besides that knight sir brandemir at thy castle to which sir adresac replied sir knight i will tell thee truly there are in my castle one and twenty other captives besides him 
to wit eighteen knights and esquires of degree and three ladies for i have defended this bridge for a long time and all who have undertaken to cross it those i have taken captive and held for ransom wherefore i have taken great wealth and gained great estate thereby then sir pelias said thou art soothly a wicked and discourteous knight so to serve travellers that come thy way and i would do well for to slay thee where thou liest but since thou hast besought mercy of me i will grant it unto thee though i will do so only with great shame unto thy knighthood moreover if i do spare to thee thy life there are several things which thou must perform first thou must go unto queen guinevere at camelot and there must thou say unto her that the knight who left her unarmed hath taken thy armour from thee and hath armed himself therewith for to defend her honour secondly thou must confess thy faults unto king arthur as thou hast confessed them unto me and thou must beg his pardon for the same craving that he in his mercy shall spare thy life unto thee these are the things that thou must perform to this sir adresac said very well these things do i promise to perform if thou wilt spare my life then sir pelias permitted him to arise and he came and stood before sir pelias and sir pelias summoned the esquire pontefferet unto him and he said take thou this knight's armour from off of his body and put it upon my body as thou knowest how to do and pontefferet did as sir pelias bade him for he unarmed sir adresac and he clothed sir pelias in sir adresac's armour and sir adresac stood ashamed before them all then sir pelias said unto him now take me into thy castle that i may there liberate those captives that thou so wickedly holdest as prisoners and sir adresac said it shall be done as thou dost command thereupon they all went together unto the castle and into the castle which was an exceedingly stately place and there they beheld a great many servants and attendants and these came at the command of sir adresac and bowed themselves down before sir pelias then sir pelias bade sir adresac for to summon the keeper of the dungeon and sir adresac did so and sir pelias commanded the keeper that he should conduct them into the dungeon and the keeper bowed down before him in obedience now when they had come to that dungeon they beheld it to be a very lofty place and exceedingly strong and there they found sir brandemere and those others of whom sir adresac had spoken but when that sorrowful lady perceived sir brandemere she ran unto him with great voice of rejoicing and embraced him and wept over him and he embraced her and wept and altogether forgot his hurt in the joy of beholding her again and in the several apartments of that part of the castle there were in all eighteen knights and esquires and three ladies besides sir brandemere moreover amongst those knights were two from king arthur's court to wit sir brandiles and sir mador de la porte whereupon these beholding that it was sir pelias who had liberated them came to him and embraced him with great joy and kissed him upon either cheek and all those who were liberated made great rejoicing and gave sir pelias such praise and acclaim that he was greatly contented therewith then when sir pelias beheld all those captives who were in the dungeon he was very wroth with sir adresac wherefore he turned unto him and said be gone sir knight for to do that penance which i imposed upon thee to perform for i am very greatly displeased with thee and fear me lest i should repent me of my mercy to thee thereupon sir adresac turned him away and he immediately departed from that place and he called to him his esquire and he took him and rode away to camelot for to do that penance which he had promised sir pelias to do then after he was gone sir pelias and those captives whom he had liberated went through the diverse parts of the castle and there they found thirteen chests of gold and silver money and four caskets of jewels very fine and of great brilliancy all of which treasure had been paid in ransom by those captives who had aforetime been violently held prisoners at that place and sir pelias ordained that all those chests and caskets should be opened and when those who were there looked therein the hearts of all were wonderfully exalted with joy at the sight of that great treasure then sir pelias commanded that all that treasure of gold and silver should be divided into nineteen equal parts and when it had been so divided he said now let each of you who have been held captive in this place take for his own one part of that treasure as a recompense for those sorrows which he hath endured moreover to each of the ladies who had been held as captives in that place he gave a casket of jewels saying unto her take thou this casket of jewels as a recompense for that sorrow which thou hast suffered 
and unto Sir Brandemere's lady he gave a casket of the jewels for that which she had endured. But then those who were there beheld that Sir Pelias reserved no part of that great treasure for himself. They all cried out to him, Sir Knight, Sir Knight, how is this? Behold, thou hast set aside no part of this treasure for thyself. Then Sir Pelias made answer, You are right, I have not so. For it needs not that I take any of this gold and silver or any of these jewels for myself. For behold, ye have suffered much at the hands of Sir Adresac, wherefore ye should receive recompense therefore. But I have suffered not at his hands, wherefore I need no such recompense. Then were they all astonished at his generosity, and gave him great praise for his largeness of heart. And all those knights vowed unto him fidelity unto death. Then, when all these things were accomplished, Sir Brandemere implored all who were there that they would come with him unto his castle, so that they might refresh themselves with a season of mirth and good faring. And they all said that they would go with him, and they did go. And at the castle of Sir Brandemere there was great rejoicing with feasting and jousting for three days. And all who were there loved Sir Pelias with an astonishing love because of that collar of emeralds and opals and of gold. Yet no one knew of the virtue of that collar, nor did Sir Pelias know of it. So Sir Pelias abided at that place for three days, and when the fourth day was come, he arose betimes in the morning, and bade saddle his horse, and the palfrey of the damsel Parsonet, and the horses of their pages. Then, when all those who were there saw that he was minded to depart, they besought him not to go. But Sir Pelias said, Stay me not, for I must go. Then came to him those two knights of Arthur's court, Sir Brandeles and Sir Mador de la Porte, and they besought him that he would let them go with him upon that adventure. And at first Sir Pelias forbade them, but they besought him the more, so that at last he was fain to say, You shall go with me. So he departed from that place with his company, and all those who remained gave great sorrow that he had gone away. End of section 28. Recording by Dominic Trace. Section 29 of The Story of King Arthur and His Knights. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Dominic Trice. Chapter 3rd. How Sir Pelias did battle with Sir Angamor, otherwise the Knight of the Green Sleeves, and of what befell the Lady Ettard. Now Sir Pelias and his party, and the damsel Parsonet and her party, travelled onward, until after a while in the afternoon they came unto the utmost boundaries of the forest, where the woodlands ceased altogether, and many fields and meadows, with farms and crofts and plantations of trees all abloom with tender leaves and fragrant blossoms, lay spread out beneath the sky. And Sir Pelias said, This is indeed a very beautiful land into which we have come. Whereat the damsel Parsonet was right well pleased, for she said, Sir, I am very glad that that which thou seest belikes thee, for all this region belongeth unto the Lady Ettard, and it is my home. Moreover, from the top of yonder hill one mayest behold the castle of Grant Mesnel, which lieth in the valley beneath. Then Sir Pelias said, Let us make haste, for I am wonderfully desirous of beholding that place. So they set spurs to their horses and rode up that hill at a hand gallop. And when they had reached the top thereof, lo, beneath them lay the castle of Grant Mesnel in such a wise that it was as though upon the palm of a hand. And Sir Pelias beheld that it was an exceedingly fair castle, built altogether without of a red stone, and containing many buildings of red brick within the wall. And behind the walls there lay a little town, and from where they stood they could behold the streets thereof, and the people coming and going upon their businesses. So Sir Pelias, beholding the excellence of that castle, said, Certes, maiden, yonder is a very fair estate. Yea, said Parsonet, we who dwell there do hold it to be a very excellent estate. Then Sir Pelias said to Parsonet, Maiden, yonder glade of young trees nigh unto the castle appeareth to be a very cheerful spot. Wherefore, at that place I and my companions in arms will take up our inn. There, likewise, we will cause to be set up three pavilions for to shelter us by day and by night. Meantime, I beseech of thee that thou wilt go unto the lady, thy mistress, and say unto her that a knight hath come unto this place, who, albeit he knoweth her not, holdeth that the lady Guinevere of Camelot is the fairest lady in all of the world. 
and I beseech thee to tell the lady that I am here to maintain that saying against all comers at the peril of my body. Wherefore, if the lady have any champion for to undertake battle in her behalf, him will I meet in yonder field to-morrow at midday a little before I eat my midday meal, for at that time I do propose for to enter into yonder field, and to make parade therein until my friends bid me for to come in to my dinner, and I shall take my stand in that place in honour of the Lady Guinevere of Camelot. Sir Peleus, said the damsel, I will even do as thou desirest of me. And, though I may not wish that thou mayest be the victor in that encounter, yet I am soothly sorry for to depart from thee. For thou art both a very valiant and a very gentle knight, and I find that I have a great friendship for thee. Then Sir Peleus laughed, and he said, Parsonet, thou art minded to give me praise that is far beyond my deserving. And Parsonet said, Sir, not so, for thou dost deserve all that I may say to thy credit. Thereupon they twain took leave of one another with very good will and much kindness of intention. And the maiden and the three pages went the one way, and Sir Peleus and his two companions and the several attendants they had brought with them went into the glade of young trees as Sir Peleus had ordained. And there they set up three pavilions in the shade of the trees, the one pavilion of fair white cloth, the second of green cloth, and the third of scarlet cloth. And over each pavilion they had set a banner emblazoned with the device of that knight unto whom the pavilion appertained. Above the white pavilion was the device of Sir Peleus, to wit, three swans displayed upon a field argent. Above the red pavilion, which was the pavilion of Sir Brandiles, was a red banner emblazoned with his device, to wit, a mailed hand holding in its grasp a hammer. Above the green pavilion, which was that of Sir Mador de la Porte, was a green banner bearing his device, which was that of a carrion crow holding in one hand a white lily flower and in the other a sword. So when the next day had come, and when midday was nigh at hand, Sir Peleus went forth into that field before the castle as he had promised to do, and he was clad all from head to foot in the red armor which he had taken from the body of Sir Adresac, so that in that armor he presented a very terrible appearance. So he rode up and down before the castle walls for a considerable while, crying out in a loud voice, What ho! What ho! Here stands a knight of King Arthur's court and of his round table, who doth affirm and is ready to maintain the same with his body, that the Lady Guinevere, King Arthur's Queen of Camelot, is the most beautiful lady in all the world, barring none whomsoever. Wherefore, if any knight maintaineth otherwise, let him straightway come forth for to defend his opinion with his body. Now after Sir Peleus had thus appeared in that meadow, there fell a great commotion within the castle, and many people came upon the walls thereof and gazed down upon Sir Peleus, where he paraded that field. And after a time had passed, the drawbridge of the castle was let fall, and there issued forth a knight, very huge of frame and exceedingly haughty of demeanor. This knight was clad altogether from head to foot in green armor, and upon either arm he wore a green sleeve, whence he was sometimes entitled the Knight of the Green Sleeves. So that green knight rode forward toward Sir Peleus, and Sir Peleus rode forward unto the green knight, and when they had come together they gave salute with a great deal of civility and knightly courtesy. Then the green knight said unto Sir Peleus, Sir knight, wilt thou allow unto me the great favor for to know thy name? Whereunto Sir Peleus made reply, That I will so. I am Sir Peleus, a knight of King Arthur's court and of his round table. Then the green knight made reply, Ha, ah, Sir Peleus, it is a great honor for me to have to do with so famous a knight, for who is there in courts of chivalry who hath not heard of thee? Now, if I have the good fortune for to overthrow thee, then will all thy honor become my honor. Now, in return for thy courtesy for making proclamation of thy name, I give unto thee my name and title, which is Sir Angamore of Malverat, further known as the Knight of the Green Sleeves. And I may furthermore tell thee that I am the champion unto the Lady Etterd of Grantmesnil, and that I have defended her credit unto peerless beauty for eleven months, and that against all comers, wherefore if I do successfully defend it for one month longer, then do I become lord of her hand and of all this fair estate. So I am prepared to do the uttermost in my power in her honor. Then Sir Peleus said, Sir Knight, I give thee gramercy for thy words of greeting, and I too will do my uttermost in this encounter. Thereupon each knight saluted the other with his lance, and each rode to his appointed station. Now a great concourse of people had come down to the lower walls of the castle and of the town for to behold the contest of arms that was toward. 
wherefore it would be hard to imagine a more worthy occasion where knights might meet in a glorious contest of friendly jousting wherefore each knight prepared himself in all ways and dressed him his spear and his lance with great care and circumspection so when all had been prepared for that encounter an herald who had come forth from the castle into the field gave the signal for assault thereupon in an instant each knight drave spurs into his horse and rushed the one against the other with such terrible speed that the ground shook and trembled beneath the beating of their horses feet so they met exactly in the centre of the field of battle the one knight smiting the other in the midst of his defences with a violence that was very terrible to behold and the spear of sir angamore burst into as many as thirty pieces but the spear of sir pelias held so that the green knight was hurtled so violently from out of his saddle that he smote the earth above a spear's length behind the crupper of his horse now when those who had stood upon the walls beheld how entirely the green knight was overthrown in the encounter they lifted up their voices in great outcry for there was no other such knight as sir angamore in all those parts and more especially did the lady ettard make great outcry for sir angamore was very much beloved by her wherefore seeing him so violently flung down upon the ground she deemed that perhaps he had been slain then three esquires ran to sir angamore and lifted him up and unlaced his helm for to give him air and they beheld that he was not slain but only in a deep swoon so by and by he opened his eyes and at that sir pelias was right glad for it would have grieved him had he slain that night now when sir angamore came back to his senses once more he demanded with great vehemence that he might continue that contest with sir pelias afoot and with swords but sir pelias would not have it so nay sir angamore quoth he i will not fight thee so serious a quarrel as that for i have no such despite against thee and at that denial sir angamore fell a-weeping from pure vexation and shame of his entire overthrow then came sir brandiles and sir mador de la porte and gave sir pelias great acclaim for the excellent manner in which he had borne himself in the encounter and at the same time they offered consolation unto sir angamore and comforted him for the misfortune that had befallen him but sir angamore would take but little comfort in their words now whiles they thus stood all together there issued out from the castle the lady ettard and an exceedingly gay and comely court of esquires and ladies and these came across the meadow toward where sir pelias and the others stood then when sir pelias beheld that lady approach he drew his misericordia and cut the thongs of his helmet and took the helmet off of his head and thus he went forward bareheaded for to meet her but when he had come nigh to her he beheld that she was many times more beautiful than that image of her painted upon the ivory panel which he had aforetime beheld wherefore his heart went forth unto her with a very great strength of liking so therewith he kneeled down upon the grass and set his hands together palm to palm before her and he said lady i do very greatly crave thy forgiveness that i should thus have done battle against thy credit for excepting that i did that endeavour for my queen i would rather in another case have been thy champion than that of any lady whom i have ever beheld now at that time sir pelias wore about his neck the colour of emeralds and opal stones and gold which the lady of the lake had given to him wherefore when the lady ettard looked upon him that necklace drew her heart unto him with very great enchantment wherefore she smiled upon sir pelias very cheerfully and gave him her hand and caused him to rise from that place where he kneeled and she said to him sir knight thou art a very famous warrior for i suppose there is not anybody who knoweth aught of chivalry but hath heard of the fame of sir pelias the gentle knight wherefore though my champion sir angamore of malverat hath heretofore overthrown all comers yet he need not feel very much ashamed to have been overthrown by so terribly strong a knight then sir pelias was very glad of the kind words which the lady ettard spake unto him and therewith he made her known unto sir brandiles and sir mador de la porte unto these knights also the lady ettard spake very graciously being moved thereto by the extraordinary regard she felt toward sir pelias so she besought those knights that they would come into the castle and refresh themselves with good cheer and with that the knights said that they would presently do so wherefore they returned each knight unto his pavilion and there each bedight himself with fine raiment and with ornaments of gold and silver in such a fashion that he was noble company for any court then those three knights betook themselves unto the castle of grant mesnil and when they had come thither everybody was astonished at the nobility of their aspect but sir angamore who had by now recovered from his fall was greatly cast down for he said unto himself who am i in the presence of these noble lords 
So he stood aside and was very downcast of heart and oppressed in his spirits. Then the Lady Ettard set a very fine feast, and Sir Pelleas and Sir Brandiles and Sir Mador de la Porte were exceedingly glad thereof. And upon her right hand she placed Sir Pelleas, and upon her left hand she placed Sir Angamore, and Sir Angamore was still more cast down, for until now he had always sat upon the right hand of the Lady Ettard. Now because Sir Pelleas wore that wonderful collar which the Lady of the Lake had given unto him, the Lady Ettard could not keep her regard from him. So after they had refreshed themselves and had gone forth into the castle Plaisance for to walk in the warm sunshine, the Lady would have Sir Pelleas continually beside her. And when it came time for those four knights to quit the castle, she besought Sir Pelleas that he would stay a while longer. Now Sir Pelleas was very glad to do that, for he was pleased beyond measure with the graciousness and the beauty of the Lady Ettard. So, by and by, Sir Brandiles and Sir Mador de la Porte went back unto their pavilions, and Sir Pelleas remained in the castle of Grant Mesnil for a while longer. End of section 29 Recording by Dominic Trice Section 30 of The Story of King Arthur and His Knights This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Dominic Trice Now that night the Lady Ettard let to be made a supper for herself and Sir Pelleas, and at that supper she and Sir Pelleas alone sat at the table, and the damsel Parsonet waited in attendance upon the Lady. Whiles they ate, certain young pages and esquires played very sweetly upon harps, and certain maidens who were attendant upon the court of the lady, sang so sweetly that it expanded the heart of the listener to hear them. And Sir Pelleas was so enchanted with the sweetness of the music, and with the beauty of the Lady Ettard, that he wist not whether he were indeed upon the earth or in paradise. Wherefore, because of his great pleasure, he said unto the Lady Ettard, Lady, I would that I might do somewhat for thee to show unto thee how high is the regard and the honor in which I hold thee. Now, as Sir Pelleas sat beside her, the Lady Ettard had continually held an observation that wonderful collar of gold, and of emerald, and of opal stones which hung about his neck, and she coveted that collar exceedingly. Wherefore she now said unto Sir Pelleas, Sir Knight, thou mayest indeed do me great favor, if thou hast a mind for to do so. What favor may I do thee, Lady? said Sir Pelleas. Sir, said the Lady Ettard, thou mayest give unto me that collar which hangeth about thy neck. At this the countenance of Sir Pelleas fell, and he said, Lady, I may not do that, for that collar came unto me in such an extraordinary fashion that I may not part it from me. Then the Lady Ettard said, Why mayest thou not part it from thee, Sir Pelleas? Thereupon Sir Pelleas told her all of that extraordinary adventure with the Lady of the Lake, and of how that fairy lady had given the collar unto him. At this the Lady Ettard was greatly astonished, and she said, Sir Pelleas, that is a very wonderful story. Nevertheless, though thou mayest not give that collar unto me, yet thou mayest let me wear it for a little while, for indeed I am charmed by the beauty of that collar beyond all manner of liking, wherefore I do beseech thee for to let me wear it for a little. Then Sir Pelleas could refuse her no longer, so he said, Lady, thou shalt have it to wear for a while. Thereupon he took the collar from off of his neck, and he hung it about the neck of the Lady Ettard. Then, after a little time, the virtue of that jewel departed from Sir Pelleas and entered into the Lady Ettard, and the Lady Ettard looked upon Sir Pelleas with altogether different eyes than those which she had before regarded him. Wherefore she said unto herself, Ha! What ailed me that I should have been so enchanted with that knight to the discredit of my champion who hath served me so faithfully? Hath not this knight done me grievous discredit? Hath he not come hitherward for no other reason than for that purpose? Hath he not overthrown mine own true knight in scorn of me? What then hath ailed me that I should have given him such regard as I have bestowed upon him? But though she thought all this, yet she made no sign thereof unto Sir Pelleas, but appeared to laugh and talk very cheerfully. Nevertheless, she immediately began to cast about in her mind for some means whereby she might be revenged upon Sir Pelleas, for she said unto herself, Lo, is he not mine enemy, and is not mine enemy now in my power? Wherefore should I not take full measure of revenge upon him for all that which he hath done unto us of Grant Mesnil? 
So by and by she made an excuse and arose and left Sir Pelias. And she took Parsonet aside and she said unto the damsel Parsonet, Go and fetch me hither presently a powerful sleeping draught. Then Parsonet said, Lady, what would you do? And the lady Ettard said, No matter. And Parsonet said, Would you give unto that noble knight a sleeping draught? And the lady said, I would. Then Parsonet said, Lady, that would surely be an ill thing to do unto one who sitteth in peace at your table and eateth of your salt. Whereunto the lady Ettard said, Take thou no care as to that, girl, but go thou straight away and do as I bid thee. Then Parsonet saw that it was not wise for her to disobey the lady, wherefore she went straight away and did as she was bidden. So she brought the sleeping draught to the lady in a chalice of pure wine, and the lady Ettard took the chalice and said to Sir Pelias, Take thou this chalice of wine, Sir Knight, and drink it unto me according to the measure of that good will thou hast unto me. Now Parsonet stood behind her lady's chair, and when Sir Pelias took the chalice, she frowned and shook her head at him. But Sir Pelias saw it not, for he was intoxicated with the beauty of the Lady Ettard, and with the enchantment of the collar of emeralds and opal stones and gold which she now wore. Wherefore he said unto her, Lady, if there were poison in that chalice, yet would I drink of the wine that is in it at thy command. At that the Lady Ettard fell a-laughing beyond measure, and she said, Sir Knight, there is no poison in that cup. So Sir Pelias took the chalice and drank the wine, and he said, Lady, how is this? The wine is bitter. To which the Lady Ettard made reply, Sir, that cannot be. Then in a little while Sir Pelias, his head waxed exceedingly heavy as if it were of lead, wherefore he bowed his head upon the table where he sat. That while the Lady Ettard remained watching him very strangely, and by and by she said, Sir Knight, dost thou sleep? To the which Sir Pelias replied not, for the fumes of the sleeping draught had ascended into his brains, and he slept. Then the Lady Ettard rose laughing, and she smote her hands together and summoned her attendants. And she said to them, Take this knight away and convey him into an inner apartment. And when ye have brought him thither, strip him of his gay clothes and of his ornaments, so that only his undergarments shall remain upon him. And when ye have done that, lay him upon a pallet and convey him out of the castle and into that meadow beneath the walls where he overthrew Sir Angamore, so that when the morning shall arise, he shall become a mock and a jest unto all who shall behold him. Thus shall we humiliate him in that same field wherein he overthrew Sir Angamore, and his humiliation shall be greater than the humiliation of Sir Angamore hath been. Now when the damsel Parsonet heard this, she was greatly afflicted, so that she withdrew herself apart and wept for Sir Pelias. But the others took Sir Pelias and did unto him as the Lady Ettard had commanded. Now when the next morning had come, Sir Pelias awoke with the sun shining into his face, and he wist not at all where he was, for his brains were befogged by the sleeping draught which he had taken. So he said unto himself, Am I dreaming, or am I awake? For certes the last that I remember was that I sat at supper with the Lady Ettard, yet here I am now in an open field with the sun shining upon me. So he raised himself upon his elbow, and behold, he lay beneath the castle walls nigh to the postern gate. And above him, upon the top of the wall, was a great concourse of people, who, when they beheld that he was awake, laughed at him and mocked at him. And the Lady Ettard also gazed down at him from a window, and he saw that she laughed at him and made herself merry. And lo, he beheld that he lay there clad only in his linen undervestment, and that he was in his bare feet as though he were prepared to sleep at night. So he sat upon the cot, saying unto himself, Certainly this must be some shameful dream that oppressed me. Nor was he at all able to recover from his bewilderment. Now as he sat thus, the postern gate was opened of a sudden, and the damsel Parsonet came out thence. And her face was all bewet with tears, and she bare in her hand a flame-colored mantle. Straightway she ran to Sir Pelias and said, Thou good and gentle knight, take thou this and wrap thyself in it. Upon this Sir Pelias wist that this was no dream, but a truth of great shame, wherefore he was possessed with an extreme agony of shame, so that he fell to trembling, whilst his teeth chattered as though with an ague. And he said to Parsonet, Maiden, I thank thee. And he could find no more words to say. So he took the mantle and wrapped himself in it. Now when the people upon the walls beheld what Parsonet had done, they hooted her and reviled her with many words of ill regard. 
so the maiden ran back again into the castle. But Sir Pelias arose and went his way toward his pavilion wrapped in that mantle. And as he went he staggered and tottered like a drunken man, for a great burden of shame lay upon him almost more than he could carry. So when Sir Pelias had reached his pavilion, he entered it and threw himself on his face upon his couch, and lay there without saying anything. And by and by Sir Brandiles and Mador de la Porte heard of that plight into which Sir Pelias had fallen, and thereupon they hastened to where he lay and made much sorrow over him. Likewise they were exceedingly wroth at the shame that had been put upon him. Wherefore they said, We will get us aid from Camelot, and we will burst open yonder castle, and we will fetch the Lady Ettard hither to crave thy pardon for this affront. This we will do, even if we have to drag her hither by the hair of her head. But Sir Pelias lifted not his head, only he groaned and said, Let be, messires, for under no circumstance shall you do that thing, she being a woman. As it is, I would defend her honor even though I died in that defense, for I know not whether I am bewitched or what it is that ails me, but I love her with a very great passion, and I cannot tear my heart away from her. At this Sir Brandiles and Sir Mador de la Porte were greatly astonished. Wherefore they said, the one to the other, Certes, that lady hath laid some powerful spell upon him. Then, after a while, Sir Pelias bade them go away and leave him, and they did so, though not with any very good will. So Sir Pelias laid there for all that day until the afternoon had come. Then he aroused himself and bade his esquire for to bring him his armor. Now when Sir Brandiles and Sir Mador de la Porte heard news of this, they went to where he was and said, Sir, what have ye a mind to do? To this Sir Pelias said, I am going to try to win me unto the Lady Ettard's presence. Then they said, What madness is this? I know not, said Sir Pelias, but meseems that if I do not behold the Lady Ettard and talk with her, I shall surely die of longing to see her. And they say, Certes, this is madness. Whereunto he replied, I know not whether it is madness or whether I am caught in some enchantment. So the esquire fetched unto Sir Pelias his armor, as he had commanded, and he clad Sir Pelias in it, so that he was altogether armed from head to foot. Thereupon straightway Sir Pelias mounted his horse and rode out toward the castle of Grant Mesnil. Now when the Lady Ettard beheld Sir Pelias again parading the meadow below the castle, she called unto her six of her best knights, and she said unto them, Behold me, sires, yonder is that knight who brought so much shame upon us yesterday. Now I bid ye for to go forth against him, and to punish him as he deserveth. So those six knights went and armed themselves, and when they had done so, they straightway rode forth against Sir Pelias. Now, when Sir Pelias beheld these approach, his heart overflowed with fury, and he shouted in a great voice, and drave forward against them. And for a while they withstood him, but he was not to be withstood, but fought with surpassing fury. Wherefore they presently brake from him, and fled. So he pursued them with great fury about that field, and smote four of them down from their horses. Then, when there were but two of those knights remaining, Sir Pelias of a sudden ceased to fight, and he cried out unto those two knights, Messires, I surrender myself unto ye. Now at that those two knights were greatly astonished, for they were entirely filled with fear of his strength, and wist not why he should yield to them. Nevertheless they came and laid hands upon him and took him toward the castle. Upon this Sir Pelias said unto himself, Now they will bring me unto the Lady Ettard, and I shall have speech with her. For it was for this that he had suffered himself to be taken by those two knights. But it was not to be as Sir Pelias willed it. For when they had brought him close under the castle, the Lady Ettard called unto them from a window in the wall, and she said, What do you with that knight? They say, We bring him to you, lady. Upon this she cried out very vehemently, Bring him not to me, but take him, and tie his hands behind his back, and tie his feet beneath his horse's belly, and send him back unto his companions. Then Sir Pelias lifted up his eyes unto that window, and he cried out in a great passion of despair, Lady, it was unto thee I surrendered, and not unto these unworthy knights. But the Lady Ettard cried out all the more vehemently, Drive him hence, for I do hate the sight of him. So those two knights did as the Lady Ettard said. They took Sir Pelias and bound him hand and foot upon his horse. And when they had done so, they allowed his horse for to bear him back again unto his companions in that wise. 
now when sir brandiles and sir mador de la porte beheld how sir pelleas came unto them with his hands bound behind his back and his feet tied beneath his horse's belly they were altogether filled with grief and despair so they loosed those cords from about his hands and feet and they cried out upon sir pelleas sir knight sir knight art thou not ashamed to permit such infamy as this and sir pelleas shook and trembled as though with an ague and he cried out in despair i care not what happens unto me they said not unto thyself sir knight but what shame dost thou bring upon king arthur and his round table upon this sir pelleas cried aloud with a great and terrible voice i care not for them either all of this befell because of the powerful enchantment of the collar of emeralds and opal stones and of gold which sir pelleas had given unto the lady ettard and which she continually wore for it was beyond the power of any man to withstand the enchantment of that collar so it was that sir pelleas was bewitched and brought to that great pass of shame end of section 30 recording by dominic trice Section 31 of the Story of King Arthur and His Knights. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Story of King Arthur and His Knights by Howard Pyle. The Book of Three Worthies, Part 2. The Story of Sir Pelleas. Chapter 4. Part One. Chapter Fourth. How Queen Guinevere quarrelled with Sir Gawain, and how Sir Gawain left the court of King Arthur for a while. Now, in the same measure that Queen Guinevere felt high regard for Sir Pelleas, in that same degree she felt misliking for Sir Gawain. For though Sir Gawain was said of many to have a silver tongue, and whiles he could upon occasion talk in such a manner as to beguile others unto his will yet he was of a proud temper and very stern and haughty wherefore he would not always brook that the lady guinevere should command him unto her will as she did other knights of that court moreover she could not ever forget how sir gawain did deny her that time at cameliard when she besought him and his companions for aid in her time of trouble nor how discourteous his speech had been to her upon that occasion. So there was no great liking between these two proud souls, for Queen Guinevere held to her way, and Sir Gawain held to his way under all circumstances. Now it happened upon an occasion that Sir Gawain and Sir Griflet and Sir Constantine of Cornwall sat talking with five ladies of the Queen's court in a pleached garden that lay beneath the tower of the Lady Guinevere, and they made very pleasant discourse together. For some whiles they would talk and make them merry with jests and contes, and other whiles one or another would take a lute that they had with them, and would play upon it and would sing. Now while these lords and ladies sat thus, enjoying pleasant discourse, and singing in that manner, Queen Guinevere sat at a window that overlooked the garden, and which was not very high from the ground, wherefore she could overhear all that they said. But these lords and ladies were altogether unaware that the queen could overhear them, so that they talked and laughed very freely, and the queen greatly enjoyed their discourse and the music that they made. That day was extraordinarily balmy, and it being well toward the sloping of the afternoon, those lords and ladies were clad in very gay attire. And of all who were there, Sir Gawain was the most gaily clad, for he was dressed in sky-blue silk embroidered with threads of silver. And Sir Gawain was playing upon the lute and singing a ballad in an exceedingly pleasing voice, so that Queen Guinevere, as she sat at the window beside the open casement, was very well content for to listen to him. Now there was a certain greyhound, of which Queen Guinevere was wonderfully fond, so much so that she had adorned its neck with a collar of gold inset with carbuncles. At that moment the hound came running into that garden, and his feet were wet and soiled with earth. So, hearing Sir Gawain singing and playing upon the lute, that hound ran unto him and leaped upon him. At this Sir Gawain was very wroth, wherefore he clinched his hand and smote the hound upon the head with the knuckles thereof, so that the hound lifted up his voice with great outcry. But when Queen Guinevere beheld that blow, she was greatly offended, wherefore she called out from her window, Why dost thou smite my dog, Messire? And those lords and ladies who were below in the garden were very much surprised and were greatly abashed, 
to find that the queen was so nigh unto them as to overhear all that they had said, and to behold all that they did. But Sir Gawain spake up very boldly, saying, Thy dog affronted me, lady, and whosoever affronteth me, him I strike. Then Queen Guinevere grew very angry with Sir Gawain, wherefore she said, Thy speech is overbold, messire. And Sir Gawain said, Not overbold, lady, but only bold enough for to maintain my rights. At this speech the Lady Guinevere's face flamed like fire, and her eyes shone very bright, and she said, I am sure that thou dost forget unto whom thou speakest, Sir Knight. At the which Sir Gawain smiled very bitterly, and said, And thou, Lady, dost not remember that I am the son of a king so powerful that he needs no help from any other king for to maintain his rights. At these words all those who were there fell as silent as though they were turned into stones, for that speech was exceedingly bold and haughty. Wherefore all looked upon the ground, for they durst not look either upon Queen Guinevere nor upon Sir Gawain. And the Lady Guinevere also was silent for a long time, endeavouring to recover herself from that speech, and when she spake it was as though she was half smothered by her anger. And she said, Sir Knight, thou art proud and arrogant beyond measure. For I did never hear of any one who dared to give reply unto his queen as thou hast spoken unto me. But this is my court, and I may command in it as I choose. Wherefore I do now bid thee for to be gone and to show thy face no more, either here nor in hall nor any of the places where I hold my court. For thou art an offence unto me. Wherefore in none of these places shalt thou have leave to show thy face, until thou dost ask my pardon for the affront which thou hast put upon me. Then Sir Gawain arose and bowed very low to the Queen Guinevere, and he said, Lady, I go. Nor will I return thitherward until thou art willing for to tell me that thou art sorry for the discourteous way in which thou hast entreated me now, and at other times before my peers. So saying, Sir Gawain took his leave from that place, nor did he turn his head to look behind him. And Queen Guinevere went into her chamber and wept in secret for anger and for shame. For indeed she was greatly grieved at what had befallen. Yet was she so proud that she would in no wise have recalled the words that she had spoken, even had she been able for to have done so. Now when the news of that quarrel had gone about the castle, it came unto the ears of Sir Ewen. Wherefore Sir Ewen went straightway unto Sir Gawain, and asked him what was ado. And Sir Gawain, who was like one distraught and in great despair, told him everything. Then Sir Erwin said, Thou wert certainly wrong for to speak unto the queen as thou didst. Nevertheless, if thou art banished from this court, I will go with thee, for thou art my cousin German, and my companion, and my heart cleaveth unto thee. So Sir Erwin went unto King Arthur, and he said, Lord, my cousin Sir Gawain hath been banished from this court by the queen, and though I may not say that he hath not deserved that punishment, yet I would fain crave thy leave for to go along with him. At this King Arthur was very grieved, but he maintained a steadfast countenance, and said, Messire, I will not stay thee from going where it pleases thee. As for thy kinsman, I dare say he gave the queen such great offence that she could not do otherwise than as she did. So both Sir Ewan and Sir Gawain went unto their inns, and commanded their esquires for to arm them. Then they with their esquires went forth from Camelot, betaking their way toward the forest lands. There those two knights and their esquires travelled for all that day until the grey of the eventide, what time the birds were singing their last songs ere closing their eyes for the night. So, finding the evening drawing on apace, those knights were afraid that they would not be able to find kindly lodging ere the night should ascend upon them, and they talked together a great deal concerning that thing. But as they came to the top of a certain hill they beheld below them a valley, very fair and well tilled, with many cottages and farm crofts. And in the midst of that valley was a goodly abbey, very fair to look upon. Wherefore Sir Gawain said unto Sir Erwin, If yonder abbey is an abbey of monks, I believe we shall find excellent lodging there for to-night. So they rode down into that valley and to the abbey, and they found a porter at the wicket, of whom they learned that it was indeed an abbey of monks. Wherefore they were very glad, and made great rejoicing. But when the abbot of that abbey learned who they were, and of what quality and high estate, he was exceedingly pleased for to welcome them. Wherefore he brought them into that part of the abbey where he himself dwelt. There he bade them welcome, and had set before them a good supper, whereat they were very much rejoiced. 
now the abbot was merry of soul and took great pleasure in discourse with strangers so he diligently inquired of those two knights concerning the reason why they were errant but they told him not concerning that quarrel at court but only that they were in search of adventure upon this the abbot said ha messires if you are in search of adventures ye may find one not very far from this place so sir gawain said what adventure is that and the abbot replied i will tell ye if ye will travel to the eastward from this place ye will come after a while to a spot where ye shall find a very fair castle of grey stone in front of that castle ye will find a good level meadow and in the midst of the meadow a sycamore tree and upon the sycamore tree a shield to which certain ladies offer affront in a very singular manner and if ye forbid those ladies to affront that shield ye will discover a very good adventure then sir gawain said that is a very strange matter now to-morrow morning we will go to that place and will endeavour to discover of what sort that adventure may be and the abbot said do so and laughed in great measure so when the next morning had come sir gawain and sir ewan gave adieu unto the abbot and took their leave of that place riding away into the eastward as the abbot had advised and after they had ridden in that direction for two or three hours or more they beheld before them the borders of a forest all green and shady with foliage and very cheerful in the warmth of the early summer day and lo immediately at the edge of the woodland there stood a fair strong castle of grey stone with windows of glass shining very bright against the sky then sir gawain and sir ewan beheld that everything was as the abbot had said for in front of the castle was a smooth level meadow with a sycamore tree in the midst thereof and as they drew near they perceived that a sable shield hung in the branches of the tree and in a little they could see that it bore the device of three white goshawks displayed but that which was very extraordinary was that in front of that shield there stood seven young damsels exceedingly fair of face and that these seven damsels continually offered a great deal of insult to that shield for some of those damsels smote it ever and anon with peeled rods of osier and others flung lumps of clay upon it so that the shield was greatly defaced therewith now nigh to the shield was a very noble appearing knight clad all in black armour and seated upon a black war-horse and it was very plain to be seen that the shield belonged unto that knight for otherwise he had no shield yet though that was very likely his shield yet the knight offered no protest either by word or by act to stay those demoiselles from offering affront thereunto then sir ewan said unto sir gawain yonder is a very strange thing that i behold like one of us is to encounter yonder knight and sir gawain said maybe so then sir ewan said if it be so then i will undertake the adventure not so said sir gawain for i will undertake it myself i being the elder of us twain and the better seasoned in knighthood so sir ewan said very well let it be that way for thou art a very much more powerful knight than i and it would be a pity for one of us to fail in this undertaking thereupon sir gawain said let be then and i will undertake it so he set spurs to his horse and he rode rapidly to where those damsels offered a front in that way to the sable shield and he set his spear in rest and shouted in a loud voice get ye away get ye away so when those damsels beheld the armed knight riding at them in that wise they fled away shrieking from before him then the sable knight who sat not a great distance away rode forward in a very stately manner unto sir gawain and he said sir knight why dost thou interfere with those ladies whereunto sir gawain replied because they offered insult unto what appeared to me to be a noble and knightly shield at this the sable knight spake very haughtily saying sir knight that shield belongeth unto me and i do assure thee that i am very well able for to take care of it without the interference of any other defender to which sir gawain said it would appear not sir knight then the sable knight said messire and thou thinkest that thou art better able to take care of that shield than i i think that thou wouldst do very well to make thy words good with thy body to this sir gawain said i will do my endeavour to show thee that i am better able to guard that shield than thou art who ownest it upon this the sable knight without further ado rode unto the sycamore tree and took down from thence the shield that hung there and he dressed the shield upon his arm and took his spear in hand and made him ready for defence and sir gawain likewise made him ready for defence and then each knight took such station upon the field as appeared unto him to be fitting now when the people of that castle perceived that a combat of arms was toward they crowded in great numbers to the walls so that there were as many as two score ladies and esquires and folk of different degrees looking down upon that field of battle from the walls 
So when those knights were altogether prepared, Sir Ewen gave the signal for encounter, and each knight shouted aloud and drave spurs into his charger, and rushed forward to the assault with a noise like thunder for loudness. Now Sir Gawain thought that he should easily overcome his adversaries in, in this assault, and that he would be able to cast him down from out of his saddle without much pains, for there was hardly any knight in that realm equal to Sir Gawain for prowess, and, indeed, he had never yet been unhorsed in combat, excepting by King Arthur. So when those two rode to the assault the one against the other, Sir Gawain thought of a surety that his adversary would fall before him. But it was not so, for in that attack Sir Gawain's spear was broken into many pieces, but the spear of the sable knight held, so that Sir Gawain was cast with great violence out of the saddle, smiting the dust with a terrible noise of falling. And so astonished was he at that fall that it appeared unto him not as though he fell from his saddle, but as though the earth rose up and smote him. Wherefore he lay for a while all stunned with the blow and with the astonishment thereof. End of section 31「of the story of King Arthur and his knights. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Story of King Arthur and his Knights by Howard Pyle. The Book of Three Worthies, Part Two. The Story of Sir Pelias. Chapter Fourth, Part Two. But when he heard the shouts of the people upon the castle wall, he immediately aroused himself from where he lay in the dust, and he was so filled with rage and shame that he was like one altogether intoxicated. Wherefore he drew his sword and rushed with great fury upon his enemy, with intent to hew him down by main strength. Then that other knight, seeing him come thus at him, immediately voided his own saddle and drew his sword and put himself in posture, either for assault or for defence. So they lashed together, tracing this way and that, and smiting with such fury that the blows they gave were most terrible for to behold. But when Sir Ewen beheld how fierce was that assault, he set spurs unto his horse and pushed him between the knight's contestant, crying out aloud, Sir Knights, Sir Knights, what is this? Here is no cause for such desperate battle. But Sir Gawain cried out very furiously, Let be, let be, and stand aside, for this quarrel concerns thee not. And the sable knight said, A horse or a foot, I am ready to meet that knight at any time. But Sir Ewen said, Not so, ye shall fight no more in this quarrel. For shame, Gawain, for shame to seek such desperate quarrel with a knight that did but meet thee in a friendly fashion, in a fair contest. Then Sir Gawain was aware that Sir Ewen was both just and right, Wherefore he put up his sword in silence, albeit he was like to weep for vexation at the shame of his overthrow. And the sable knight put up his sword also, and so peace was made betwixt those two. Then the sable knight said, I am glad that this quarrel is ended, for I perceive, messires, that ye are assuredly knights of great nobility and gentleness of breeding. Wherefore I would that we might henceforth be friends and companions instead of enemies. Wherefore I do beseech ye for to come with me a little ways from here, where I have taken up my inn, so that we may rest and refresh ourselves in my pavilion. Unto this Sir Erwin said, I give thee gramercy for thy courtesy, Sir Knight, and we will go with thee with all the pleasure that it is possible to feel. And Sir Gawain said, I am content. So these three knights straightway left the field of battle. And when they had come to the edge of the forest, Sir Gawain and Sir Ewen perceived a very fine pavilion of green silk set up beneath the tree. And about that pavilion were many attendants of divers sorts, all clad in colours of green and white. So Sir Gawain perceived that the knight who had overthrown him was certainly someone of very high estate, wherefore he was very greatly comforted. Then the esquires of those three knights came and removed the helmet, each esquire from his knight, so that the knight might be made comfortable thereby. And when this was done, Sir Gawain and Sir Ewen perceived that the sable knight was very comely of countenance, being ruddy of face and with hair like to copper for redness. Then Sir Ewen said unto the knight, Sir unknown knight, this knight, my companion, is Sir Gawain, son of King Urien of Gore, and I am Ewen, the son of King Lot of Orkney. Now I crave of thee that thou wilt make thyself known unto us in like manner. Ha, ah, said the other, I am glad that ye are such very famous and royal knights, for I am also of royal blood, 
being Sir Marhaus, the son of the King of Ireland. Then Sir Gawain was very glad to discover how exalted was the quality of that knight who overthrew him, and he said unto Sir Marhaus, Messire, I make my vow, that thou art one of the most terrible knights in the world. For thou hast done unto me this day what only one knight in all the world have ever done, and that is King Arthur, who is my uncle and my lord. Now thou must certainly come unto the court of King Arthur, for he will be wonderfully glad for to see thee, and maybe he will make thee a knight of his round table, and there is no honour in all of the world that can be so great as that. Thus he spoke unthinkingly, and then he remembered, wherefore he smote his fist against his forehead, crying out, Aha! Aha! Who am I for to bid thee to come unto the court of King Arthur, who only yesterday was disgraced and banished therefrom? Then Sir Marhaus was very sorry for Sir Gawain, and he inquired concerning the trouble that lay upon him. And Sir Ewen told Sir Marhaus all about that quarrel. At that Sir Marhaus was still more sorry for Sir Gawain. Wherefore he said, Messires, I like ye both wonderfully well, and I would fain become your companion in the adventures ye are to undertake. For now I need remain here no longer. Ye must know that I was obliged to defend those ladies who assailed my shield, until I had overthrown seven knights in their behalf. And I must tell ye, that Sir Gawain was the seventh knight I have overthrown. Wherefore, since I have now overthrown him, I am now released from my obligation, and may go with ye. Then Sir Gawain and Sir Ewen were very much astonished that any knight should lie beneath so strange an obligation as that to defend those who assailed his shield, and they besought Sir Marhaus to tell them why he should have been obliged to fulfill such a pledge. So Sir Marhaus said, I will tell ye, the case was this. Some whiles ago I was travelling in these parts with a hawk upon my wrist. At that time I was clad very lightly in holiday attire, to wit, I wore a tunic of green silk, and hosen one of green and one of white, and I had nothing upon me by way of defence, but a light buckler and a short sword. Now coming unto a certain stream of water, very deep and rapid, I perceived before me a bridge of stone crossing that stream but so narrow that only one horseman might cross the bridge at a time. So I entered upon that bridge, and was part way across it, when I perceived a knight in armour coming the other way. And behind the knight there sat upon a pillion a very fair lady with golden hair, and very proud of demeanour. Now when that knight perceived me upon the bridge, he cried aloud, Get back, get back, and suffer me to pass. But this I would not do, but said, Not so, Sir Knight. For having advanced so far upon this bridge, I have certes the right of way to complete my passage, and it is for you to wait and to permit me to cross. But the knight would not do so, but immediately put himself in posture of offence, and straightway came against me upon the bridge with intent either to slay me or to drive me back unto the other extremity of the bridge. But this he was not able to do, for I defended myself very well with my light weapons. And I so pushed my horse against his horse, that I drave him backward from off the bridge and into the water, whereinto the horse and the knight and the lady all of them fell with a terrible uproar. At this the lady shrieked in great measure, and both she and the knight were like to drown in the water, the knight being altogether clad in armour, so that he could not uplift himself above the flood. Wherefore, beholding their extremity, I leaped from off my horse and into the water, and with great ado and with much danger unto myself, I was able to bring them both unto the land. But that lady was very greatly offended with me, for her fair raiment was altogether wet and spoiled by the water, wherefore she upbraided me with great vehemence. So I kneeled down before her, and besought her pardon with all humility, but she still continued to upbraid me. Then I offered unto her for to perform any penance that she might set upon me. At this the lady appeared to be greatly mollified, for she said, Very well, I will set thee a penance. And when her knight had recovered, she said, Come with us and so I mounted my horse and followed them. So after we had gone a considerable distance, we came to this place, and here she commanded me as follows. Sir Knight, quoth she, this castle belongeth unto me, and unto this knight who is my lord. Now this shall be the penance for the affront thou hast given me. Thou shalt take thy shield, and hang it up in yonder sycamore tree, and every day I will send certain damsels of mine own out from the castle and they shall offend against that shield, and thou shalt not only suffer whatever offence they may offer, but thou shalt defend them against all comers, until thou hast overcome seven knights. 
So I have done until this morning, when thou, Sir Gawain, camest hither. Thou art the seventh knight against whom I have contended, and as I have overcome thee, my penance is now ended, and I am free. Then Sir Gawain and Sir Ewen gave Sir Marhaus great joy that his penance was completed, and they were very well satisfied each party with the others. So Sir Gawain and Sir Ewen abided that night in the pavilion of Sir Marhaus, and the next morning they arose, and having laved themselves in a forest stream, they departed from that place where they were. So they entered the forest land once more, and made their way by certain paths they knew not whitherward, and they travelled all that morning, and until the afternoon was come. Now as they travelled thus, Sir Marhaus said of a sudden, Messiahs, know ye where we are come to? Nay, they said, we know not. Then Sir Marhaus said, This part of the forest is called Aroy, and it is further called the Forest of Adventure. For it is very well known that when a knight or a party of knights enter this forest, they will assuredly meet with an adventure of some sort, from which some come forth with credit, while others fail therein. And Sir Ewen said, I am glad that we have come hither. Now let us go forward into this forest. So those three knights and their esquires continued onward in that woodland, where was silence so deep that even the tread of their horses upon the earth was scarcely to be heard. And there was no note of bird, and no sound of voice, and hardly did any light penetrate into the gloom of that woodland. Wherefore those knights said unto one another, This is soothly a very strange place, and one maybe of enchantment. Now when they had come into the very midst of these dark woodlands, they perceived of a sudden, in the pathway before them, a fawn as white as milk, and round the neck of the fawn was a collar of pure gold. And the fawn stood and looked at them. But when they had come nigh to it, it turned, and ran along a very narrow path. Then Sir Gawain said, Let us follow that fawn, and see where it goeth. And the others said, We are content. So they followed that narrow path, until of a sudden they came to where was a little open lawn, very bright with sunlight. In the midst of the lawn was a fountain of water, and there was no fawn to be seen, but lo, beside the fountain there sat a wonderfully beautiful lady, clad all in garments of green. And the lady combed her hair with a golden comb, and her hair was like to the wing of a raven for blackness. And upon her arms she wore very wonderful bracelets of emeralds and of opal stones, and set into cunningly wrought gold. Moreover, the face of the lady was like ivory for whiteness, and her eyes were bright like jewels set in ivory. Now when this lady perceived the knights, she arose and laid aside her golden comb, and bound up the locks of her hair with ribbons of scarlet silk, and thereupon she came to those knights and gave them greeting. Then those three knights gat them down straightway from off their horses, and Sir Gawain said, Lady, I believe that thou art not of mortal sort, but that thou art a fairy. Unto this the lady said, Sir Gawain, thou art right. And Sir Gawain marveled that she should know his name so well. Then he said to her, Lady, who art thou? And she made answer, My name is Nimue, and I am the chiefest of those ladies of the lake of whom thou mayest have heard. For it was I who gave unto King Arthur his sword Excalibur, for I am very friendly unto King Arthur and to all the noble knights of his court. So it is that I know ye all, and I know that thou, Sir Marhaus, shall become one of the most famous knights of the round table. And all they three marvelled at the lady's words. Then she said, I prithee tell me what it is that ye seek in these parts. And they say, We seek adventure. Well, said she, I will bring you unto adventure, but it is Sir Gawain who must undertake it. And Sir Gawain said, that is very glad news. Then the lady said, Take me behind you upon your saddle, Sir Gawain, and I will show unto you that adventure. So Sir Gawain took the lady up behind him upon the saddle, and lo, she brought with her a fragrance such as he had never known before. For that fragrance was so subtle that it seemed to Sir Gawain that the forest gave forth that perfume which the lady of the lake brought with her. So the Lady of the Lake brought them by many devious ways out from that part of the forest. And she brought them by sundry roads and paths, until they came out into an open country, 
very fruitful and pleasant to behold. And she brought them up a very high hill, and from the top of the hill they looked down upon a fruitful and level plain as upon a table spread out before them. And they beheld that in the midst of the plain was a noble castle built all of red stone and of red bricks, and they beheld that there was a small town built also of red bricks. Now as they sat their horses there on top of the hill, they perceived of a sudden a knight clad all in red armor who came forth from a glade of trees. And they saw that the knight paraded the meadow that lay in front of the castle, and they saw that he gave challenge to those within the castle. Then they perceived that the drawbridge of the castle was let fall of a sudden, and that there issued from thence ten knights clad in complete armor. And they beheld those ten knights assail the one knight in red armor, and they beheld the one knight assail the ten. And they beheld that for a while those ten withstood the one, but that he assailed them so terribly that he smote down four of them very quickly. Then they beheld that the rest brake and fled from before that one, and that the red knight pursued the others about the meadow with great fury. And they saw that he smote down one from out of his saddle and another and another, until but two of those knights were left. Then Sir Gawain said, That is certainly a very wonderful sight for to see. But the Lady of the Lake only smiled, and said, Wait a little. So they waited, and they saw that when the Red Knight had smitten down all of his enemies but those two, and that when he had put those two in great peril of their lives, he of a sudden sheathed his sword and surrendered himself unto them. And they saw that those two knights brought the Red Knight to the castle, and that when they had brought him there, a lady upon the wall thereof bespake that Red Knight as with great violence of language. And they beheld that those two knights took the Red Knight and bound his hands behind his back, and that they bound his feet beneath his horse's belly, and that they drave him away from that place. All this they beheld from the top of that hill. And the Lady of the Lake said unto Sir Gawain, There thou shalt find thy adventure, Sir Gawain. And Sir Gawain said, I will go. And the Lady of the Lake said, Do so. Thereupon, lo, she vanished from their sight, and they were greatly amazed. End of section 32section thirty three of the story of king arthur and his knights this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org the story of king arthur and his knights by howard pyle the book of three worthies part two the story of sir pelias Chapter Fifth, Part One How Sir Gawain met Sir Pelias, and how he promised to aid him with the Lady Ettard. Now, after that wonderful lady had disappeared from their sight in that manner, those three knights stood for a little while altogether astonished, for they wist not how to believe what their eyes had beheld. Then, by and by, Sir Gawain spake, saying, Certes, that was a very wonderful thing that happened to us. For in all my life I never knew so strange a miracle to befall. Now it is very plain that some excellent adventure lieth in what we have seen. Wherefore let us descend into yonder valley, for there we shall doubtless discover what that signifies which we have just now beheld. For I make my vow that I have hardly ever seen so terribly powerful a knight as he who has just now fought yonder battle, Wherefore I can in no wise understand why, when he should so nearly have obtained a victory over his enemies, he should have surrendered himself to them as he did. And Sir Erwin and Sir Marhaus agreed that it would be well to go down and inquire what was the meaning of that which they had beheld. So they three and their attendants rode down into the valley, and they rode forward until they had come to a certain glade of trees, and there they beheld three goodly pavilions that stood there the one pavilion of white cloth, the second pavilion of green cloth, and the third pavilion of scarlet cloth. Now as the three knights' companion drew nigh to the pavilions, there came forth two knights to meet them. And when Sir Gawain and Sir Ewan saw the shields of the two, they immediately knew that they were Sir Brandiles and Sir Mador de la Porte. 
and in the same manner sir brandiles and sir mador de la porte knew sir gawain and sir ewen and each party was very much astonished at thus meeting the other in so strange a place so when they came together they gave one another very joyful greeting and clasped hands with strong love and good fellowship then sir gawain made sir marhaus acquainted with sir brandiles and sir mador de la porte and thereupon the five knights all went together into those three pavilions discoursing the while with great amity and pleasure and when they had come into the pavilion of sir brandiles they found there spread a good refreshment of white bread and wine of excellent savour then after a while sir gawain said to sir brandiles and sir mador de la porte messires we observed a little while ago a very singular thing for as we stood together at the top of yonder hill and looked down into this plain we beheld a single knight clad all in red armor who did battle with ten knights and that one knight in red armor combated the ten with such fury that he drave them all from before him though they were so many and he but one and truly i make my vow that i have hardly ever seen a knight show such great prowess in arms as he yet when he had overcome all but two of those knights and was in fair way to win a clear victory he suddenly yielded himself unto the two and suffered them to take him and bind him and drive him with great indignity from the field now i pray ye tell me what was the meaning of that which we beheld and who was that knight who fought so great a battle and yet yielded himself so shamefully at this sir brandiles and sir mador de la porte made no answer but directed their looks another way for they knew not what to say but when sir gawain beheld that they were abashed he began more than ever to wonder what that thing meant wherefore he said what is this why do you not answer me i bid ye tell me what is the meaning of your looks and who is that red knight then after a while sir mador de la porte said i shall not tell you but you may come and see then sir gawain began to think maybe there was something in this that it would be better not to publish and that haply he had best examine further into the matter alone so he said unto the other knights bide ye here a little messires and i will go with sir mador de la porte so sir gawain went with sir mador de la porte and sir mador led him unto the white pavilion and when they had come there sir mador drew aside the curtains of the pavilion and he said enter and sir gawain entered now when he had come into the pavilion he perceived that a man sat upon a couch of rushes covered with an azure cloth, and in a little he perceived that man was Sir Pelias. But Sir Pelias saw not him immediately, but sat with his head bowed like one altogether overwhelmed by a great despair. But when Sir Gawain beheld who it was that sat upon the couch, he was greatly amazed and cried out, Ha, is it thou, Sir Pelias? Is it thou? But when Sir Pelias heard Sir Gawain's voice, and when he perceived who it was that spake to him he emitted an exceedingly bitter cry and sprang to his feet and ran as far away as the walls of the pavilion would let him and turned his face unto the walls thereof then after a while sir gawain spoke very sternly to sir pelias saying messire i am astonished and very greatly ashamed that a knight of king arthur's royal court and of his round table should behave in so dishonourable a manner as i saw thee behave this day for it is hardly to be believed that a knight of such repute and nobility as thou would suffer himself to be taken and bound by two obscure knights as thou didst suffer thyself this day how couldst thou bring thyself to submit to such indignity and insult now i do demand of thee that thou wilt explain this matter unto me but sir pelias was silent and would not make any reply then sir gawain cried out very fiercely ha wilt thou not answer me and sir pelias shook his head then sir gawain said still speaking very fiercely messire thou shalt answer me one way or another for either thou shalt tell me the meaning of thy shameful conduct or else thou shalt do extreme battle with me for I will not suffer it that thou shalt bring such shame upon King Arthur and his round table without myself defending the honour and the credit of him and of it. One while thou and I were dear friends, but unless thou dost immediately exculpate thyself, 
I shall hold thee in contempt, and shall regard thee as an enemy. Upon this Sir Pelias spake like unto one that was nigh distracted, and he said, I will tell thee all. Then he confessed everything unto Sir Gawain, telling all that had befallen since that time when he had left the May court of Queen Guinevere to enter upon this adventure. And Sir Gawain listened unto him with great amazement. And when Sir Pelias had made an end of telling all that had befallen him, Sir Gawain said, Certes, this is very wonderful. Indeed, I cannot understand how thou camest to be so entangled in the charms of this lady, unless she hath bewitched thee with some great enchantment. Unto this Sir Pelias said, Yea, I believe that I have been bewitched, for I am altogether beside myself in this, and am entirely unable to contain my passion. Then Sir Gawain bethought him for a long while, considering that matter very seriously, and by and by he said, I have a plan, and it is this. I will go unto the Lady Ettard myself, and will inquire diligently into this affair. And if I find that any one hath entangled thee in enchantments, it will go hard with me, but I will punish that one with great dolor. For I shall not have it that another enchanter shall beguile thee, as one hath already beguiled Merlin the wise. Then Sir Pelias said unto Sir Gawain, How wilt thou accomplish this matter, so as to gain into the presence of the Lady Ettard? Thereupon Sir Gawain replied, That I will tell thee. We twain shall exchange armor, and I will go unto the castle in thy armor. When I have come there, I shall say that I have overcome thee in an encounter, and have taken thine armor away from thee. Then they will haply admit me into the castle to hear my story, and I shall have speech with her. Then Sir Pelias said, Very well, it shall be as thou dost ordain. So Sir Pelias summoned an esquire, and Sir Gawain summoned his esquire, and those two removed the armor from Sir Pelias, and clad Sir Gawain therein. After they had done that, Sir Gawain mounted upon the horse of Sir Pelias, and rode openly into that field wherein Sir Pelias had aforetime paraded. Now it happened that the Lady Ettard was at that time walking upon a platform within the castle walls, from which place she looked down into that meadow. So when she beheld a red knight parading in the meadow, she thought it was Sir Pelias come thither again, and at that she was vexed and affronted beyond all measure. Wherefore she said unto those nigh her, that knight vexes me so woefully that I fear me I shall fall ill of vexation if he cometh here many more times. I would that I knew how to rid myself of him, for already and only an hour ago I sent ten good knights against him, and he overcame them all with great despatch and with much dishonor unto them and unto me. So she beckoned to the red knight, and when he had come nigh to the walls of the castle she said to him, Sir knight, why dost thou come hitherward to afflict me and to affront me thus? Canst thou not understand that the more often thou comest to tease me in this manner, the more do I hate thee? Then Sir Gawain opened the umbril of his helmet and showed his face, and the Lady Ettard saw that the red knight was not Sir Pelias. And Sir Gawain said, Lady, I am not that one whom thou supposest me to be, but another. For behold, I have thine enemy's armor upon my body, wherefore thou mayest see that I have overcome him. For thou mayest suppose that it is hardly to be thought that I could wear his armor unless I took it from him by force of arms. Wherefore thou needest trouble thyself no more about him. Then the Lady Ettard could not think otherwise than this knight, whom she knew not, had indeed overthrown Sir Pelias in a bout of arms, and had taken his armor away from him. And indeed she was exceedingly astonished that such a thing could have happened, for it appeared to her that Sir Pelias was one of the greatest knights in the world, wherefore she marveled who this knight could be who had overthrown him in battle. So she gave command to sundry of those in attendance upon her that they should go forth and bring that red knight into the castle, and that they should pay him great honor for that he must assuredly be one of the very greatest champions in the world. Thus Sir Gawain came into the castle, and was brought before the Lady Ettard, where she stood in a wonderfully large and noble hall. For that hall was illuminated by seven tall windows of colored glass, and it was hung around with tapestries and hangings, very rich and of a most excellent quality, 
wherefore sir gawain was greatly astonished at the magnificence of all that he beheld in that place now sir gawain had taken the helmet from off his head and he bore it under his arm and against his hip and his head was bare so that all who were there could see his face very plainly wherefore they all perceived that he was exceedingly comely that his eyes were as blue as steel his nose high and curved and his hair and beard very dark and rich in colour moreover his bearing was exceedingly steadfast and haughty so that those who beheld him were awed by the great knightliness of his aspect then the lady ettard came to sir gawain and gave him her hand and he kneeled down and set it to his lips and the lady bespoke him very graciously saying sir knight it would give me a great deal of pleasure if thou wouldst make us acquainted with thy name and if thou wouldst proclaim thy degree of estate unto us unto this sir gawain made reply lady i cannot inform you of these things at these present being just now vowed unto secrecy upon those points wherefore i do crave your patience for a little then the lady ettard said sir knight it is a great pity that we may not know thy name and degree Nevertheless, though we are as yet in ignorance as to thy quality i yet hope that thou wilt give us the pleasure of thy company a while and that thou wilt condescend to remain within this poor place for two days or three whilst we offer thee such refreshment as we are able to do end of section thirty three Section 34 of the story of King Arthur and his knights. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Story of King Arthur and his Knights by Howard Pyle. The Book of Three Worthies, Part 2. The Story of Sir Pelias, Chapter 5th, Part 2. Now here a very untoward thing befell, to wit it was this, the Lady Ettard had come to love that necklace of emeralds and of opal stones and of gold that she had borrowed from Sir Pelias, and that to such a degree that she never let it depart from her, whether by day or by night. Wherefore she wore it at that moment hanging about her neck and her throat. So, as she talked to Sir Gawain, he looked upon that necklace, and the enchantment thereof began to take a very great hold upon him. For he presently began to feel as though his heart was drawn with exceeding ardency out of his bosom and unto the lady ettard so much so that in a little while he could not at all keep his regard withdrawn from her and the more he looked upon the necklace and the lady the more did the enchantment of the jewel take hold upon his spirits accordingly when the lady ettard spake so graciously unto him he was very glad to accept of her kindness wherefore he said gazing very ardently at her the whiles lady thou art exceedingly gentle to extend so great a courtesy unto me wherefore i shall be glad beyond measure for to stay with thee for a short while at these words the lady ettard was very greatly pleased for she said to herself certes this knight albeit i know not who he may be must be a champion of extraordinary prowess and of exalted achievement now if I can persuade him to remain in this castle as my champion, then shall I doubtless gain very great credit thereby, for I shall have one for to defend my rights, who must assuredly be the greatest knight in all the world. Wherefore she set forth every charm and grace of demeanour to please Sir Gawain, and Sir Gawain was altogether delighted by the kindness of her manner. Now Sir Engamore was there present at that time, wherefore he was very greatly troubled in spirit for in the same degree that sir gawain received courtesy from the lady ettard in that same degree sir engamore was cast down into great sorrow and distress so much so that it was a pity for to see him for sir engamore said to himself what foretime ere these foreign knights came hitherward the lady ettard was very kind to me and was willing to take me for her champion and lord but first came sir pelias and overthrew me and now cometh this strange knight and overthroweth him wherefore in the presence of such a great champion as this i am come to be as nothing in her sight so sir engamore withdrew himself from that place and went unto his closet where he sat himself down alone in great sorrow now the lady ettard had given command that a very noble and splendid feast should be prepared for sir gawain and for herself 
and whilst it was preparing she and Sir Gawain walked together in the pleasaunce of the castle, for there was a very pleasant shade in the place, and flowers grew there in great abundance, and many birds sang very sweetly in among the blossoms of the trees. And as Sir Gawain and the lady walked thus together, the attendants stood at a little distance and regarded them, and they said to one another, Assuredly it would be a very good thing if the Lady Ettard would take this knight for her champion, and if he should stay here in Grant Menla for ever. So Sir Gawain and the Lady walked together, talking very cheerfully until sunset, and at that time the supper was prepared, and they went in and sat down to it. And as they supped, a number of pages, very fair of face, played upon harps before them, and sundry damsels sang very sweetly in accord to that music, so that the bosom of Sir Gawain was greatly expanded with joy. Wherefore he said to himself, Why should I ever leave this place? Lo, I have been banished from King Arthur's court. Why then should I not establish here a court of mine own that might in time prove to be like to his for glory? And the Lady Ettard was so beautiful in his eyes that this seemed to him to be a wonderfully pleasant thought. Now turn we unto Sir Pelias, for after Sir Gawain had left him, the heart of Sir Pelias began to misgive him that he had not been wise, and at last he said to himself, Suppose that Sir Gawain should forget his duty to me when he meeteth the Lady Ettard, for it seems that haply she possesses some potent charm that might well draw the heart of Sir Gawain unto her. Wherefore, if Sir Gawain should come within the circle of such enchantment as that, he may forget his duty unto me, and may transgress against the honour of his knighthood. And the more that Sir Pelias thought of this, the more troubled he grew in his mind. So at last, when evening had fallen, he called an esquire unto him, and he said, Go and fetch me hither the garb of a black friar, for I would fain go into the castle of Grant Menla in disguise. So the esquire went, as he commanded, and brought him such a garb, and Sir Pelias clad himself therein. Now, by that time, the darkness had come entirely over the face of the earth, so that it would not have been possible for any one to know Sir Pelias, even if they had seen his face. So he went unto the castle, and they who were there, thinking that he was a black friar, as he appeared to be, admitted him into the castle by the postern gate. So, as soon as Sir Pelias had come into the castle, he began to make diligent inquiry concerning where he might find that knight who had come thither in the afternoon, and those within the castle, still thinking him to be a friar of black orders, said unto him, What would ye with that knight? To the which Sir Pelias said, I have a message for him. They of the castle said, Ye cannot come at that knight just now, for he is at supper with the Lady Ettard, and he holds her in pleasant discourse. At this Sir Pelias began to wax very angry, for he greatly misliked the thought that Sir Gawain should then make merry with the Lady Ettard. So he said, speaking very sternly, I must presently have speech with that knight, wherefore I bid ye to bring me unto him without delay. Then they of the castle said, Wait, and we will see if that knight is willing to have you come to him. So one of the attendants went unto that place where Sir Gawain sat at supper with the Lady Ettard, and he said, Sir knight, there hath come hither a black friar who demandeth to have present speech with thee, and he will not be denied, but continually maketh that demand. At this Sir Gawain was greatly troubled in his conscience, for he knew that he was not dealing honourably by Sir Pelias, and he pondered whether or not this black friar might be a messenger from his friend but yet he could not see how he might deny such a messenger's speech with him. So after a while of thought he said, Fetch the black friar hither, and let him deliver his message to me. So Sir Pelias, in the garb of a black friar, was brought by the attendants into the outer room of that place where Sir Gawain sat at supper with the lady. But for a little time Sir Pelias did not enter the room, but stood behind the curtain of the anteroom and looked upon them, for he desired to make sure as to whether or no Sir Gawain was true to him. Now everything in that room where the knight and the lady sat was bedight with extraordinary splendour, and it was illuminated by a light of several score of waxen tapers that sent forth a most delightful perfume as they burned. And as Sir Pelias stood behind the curtains, he beheld Sir Gawain and the Lady Ettard as they sat at the table together, and he saw that they were filled with pleasure in the company of one another. And he saw that Sir Gawain and the lady quaffed wine out of the same chalice, and that the cup was of gold. And as he saw those two making merry with one another, he was filled with great anger and indignation, for he now perceived that Sir Gawain had betrayed him. So, by and by, he could contain himself no longer, wherefore he took five steps into that room and stood before Sir Gawain and the Lady Ettard, and when they looked upon him in great surprise, he cast back the hood from his face, and they knew him. 
then the lady ettard shrieked with great vehemence crying out i have been betrayed and sir gawain sat altogether silent for he had not a single word to say either to the lady or to sir pelias then sir pelias came close to the lady ettard with such a fell countenance that she could not move for fear and when he had come nigh to her he catched that necklace of emeralds and opal stones and gold with such violence that he brake the clasp thereof and so plucked it from her neck then he said this is mine and thou hast no right to it and therewith he thrust it into his bosom then he turned upon sir gawain where he sat and he said thou art false both unto thy knighthood and unto thy friendship for thou hast betrayed me utterly thereupon he raised his arm and smote sir gawain upon the face with the back of his hand so violently that the mark of his fingers was left in red all across the cheek of sir gawain then sir gawain fell as pale as ashes and he cried out sir i have in sooth betrayed thee but thou hast offered such affront to me that our injury is equal to the which sir pelias made reply not so for the injury i gave to thee is only upon thy cheek but the injury thou gavest to me is upon my heart nevertheless i will answer unto thee for the affront i have done thee but thou also shalt answer unto me for the offence thou hast done unto me in that thou hast betrayed me then sir gawain said i am willing to answer unto thee in full measure and sir pelias said thou shalt indeed do so thereupon he turned and left that place nor did he so much as look again either at sir gawain or at the lady ettard but now that the lady ettard no longer had the magic collar about her neck sir gawain felt nothing of the great enchantment that had aforetime drawn him so vehemently unto her accordingly he now suffered a misliking for her as great as that liking which had aforetime drawn him unto her wherefore he said to himself how was it possible that for this lady i could have so betrayed my knighthood and have done so much harm unto my friend so he pushed back his chair very violently and arose from that table with intent to leave her but when the lady ettard saw his intent she spake to him with very great anger for she was very much affronted in that he had deceived her when he said that he had overcome sir pelias wherefore she said with great heat thou mayest go and i am very willing for to have thee do so for thou didst say false when thou didst tell me that thou hadst overcome sir pelias for now i perceive that he is both a stronger and a nobler knight than thou for he smote thee as though thou wert his servant and thou yet bearest the marks of his fingers upon thy cheek at this sir gawain was exceedingly wroth and entirely filled with the shame of that which had befallen him wherefore he said lady i think thou hast bewitched me to bring me to such a pass of dishonour as for sir pelias look forth into that meadow to-morrow and see if i do not put a deeper mark upon him than ever he hath put upon me thereupon he left that place and went down into the courtyard and called upon the attendants who were there to for to fetch him his horse so they did as he commanded and he straightway rode forth into the night and he was very glad of the darkness of the night for it appeared to him that it was easier to bear his shame in the darkness wherefore when he had come to the glade of trees he would not enter the pavilion where his friends were and also when sir ewen and sir marhaus came out unto him and bade him to come in he would not do so but stayed without in the darkness for he said unto himself if i go in where is a light haply they will behold the mark of sir pelias his hand upon my face so he stayed without in the darkness and bade them to go away and leave him alone but when they had gone he called his esquire unto him and he said take this red armour off me and carry it unto the pavilion of sir pelias for i hate it so the esquire did as sir gawain commanded and sir gawain walked up and down for the entire night greatly troubled in spirit and in heart end of section thirty four section thirty five of the story of king arthur and his knights this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org the story of king arthur and his knights by howard pyle the book of three worthies part two the story of sir pelias chapter sixth part one how the lady of the lake took back her necklace from sir pelias now when the next morning had come sir gawain summoned his esquire unto him and said fetch hither my armour and case me in it and the esquire did so then sir gawain said 
help me unto my horse. And the esquire did so. And the morning was still very early, with the grass all lustrous and sparkling with dew, and the little birds singing with such vehemence that it might have caused any one great joy to be alive. Wherefore, when Sir Gawain was seated a horseback and in armour, he began to take more courage unto himself, and the dark vapours that had Willem overshadowed him lifted themselves a little. So he bespoke his esquire with stronger voice, saying, Take this glove of mine, and bear it to Sir Pelias, and tell him that Sir Gawain parades in the meadow in front of the castle, and that he there challenges Sir Pelias for to meet him a horse or a foot, howsoever that knight may choose. At these that esquire was very much astonished, for Sir Gawain and Sir Pelias had always been such close friends that there was hardly their like for friendship in all that land, wherefore their love for one another had become a byword with all men. But he held his peace concerning his thoughts, and only said, Wilt thou not eat food ere thou goest to battle? And Sir Gawain said, Nay, I will not eat until I have fought. Wherefore do thou go and do as I have bid thee? So Sir Gawain's esquire went to Sir Pelias in his pavilion, and he gave unto that knight the glove of Sir Gawain, and he delivered Sir Gawain's message to him. And Sir Pelias said, Tell thy master that I will come forth to meet him as soon as I have broken my fast. Now when the news of that challenge had come to the ears of Sir Brandiles and Sir Mador de la Porte, and Sir Ewan and Sir Marhaus, those knights were greatly disturbed thereat. And Sir Ewan said to the others, Messires, let us go and make inquiries concerning this business. So the four knights went to the white pavilion where Sir Pelias was breaking his fast. And when they had come into the presence of Sir Pelias, Sir Ewan said to him, What is this quarrel betwixt my kinsman and thee? And Sir Pelias made reply, I will not tell thee, so let be, and meddle not with it. Then Sir Ewan said, Wouldst thou do serious battle with thy friend? To which Sir Pelias said, He is a friend to me no longer. Then Sir Brandiles cried out, It is a great pity that a quarrel should lie betwixt such friends as thou and Sir Gawain. Wilt thou not let us make peace betwixt you? But Sir Pelias replied, Ye cannot make peace, for this quarrel cannot be stayed until it is ended. Then those knights saw that their words could be of no avail, and they went away and left Sir Pelias. So when Sir Pelias had broken his fast, he summoned an esquire named Montenoir, and he bade him case him in that red armor that he had worn for all this time, and Montenoir did so. Then, when Sir Pelias was clad in that armor, he rode forth into the meadow before the castle where Sir Gawain paraded. And when he had come thither, those four other knights came to him again, and besought him that he would let peace be made betwixt him and Sir Gawain. But Sir Pelias would not listen to them, and so they went away again, and left him, and he rode forth into the field before the castle of Grant Mendle. Now a great concourse of people had come down upon the castle walls for to behold that assault at arms, for news thereof had gone all about that place. And it had also come to be known that the knight that would do combat with Sir Pelias was that very famous royal knight hight Sir Gawain, the son of King Lot of Orkney, and a nephew of King Arthur. Wherefore all the people were very desirous to behold so famous a knight do battle. Likewise the Lady Ettard came down to the walls, and took her stand in a lesser tower that overlooked the field of battle. And when she had taken her stand at that place, she beheld that Sir Pelias wore that necklace of emeralds and opal stones and gold above his body armour, and her heart went out to him because of it wherefore she hoped that he might be the victor in that encounter. Then each knight took his station in such place as seemed to him to be fitting, and they dressed each his spear and his shield, and made him ready for the assault. Then when they were in all ways prepared, Sir Marhaus gave the signal for the assault. Thereupon each knight instantly quitted that station which he held, dashing against the other with the speed of lightning, and with such fury that the earth thundered and shook beneath their horses' hooves. So they met fairly in the centre of the course, each knight striking the other in the very midst of his defences. And in that encounter the spear of Sir Gawain burst even to the handguard, but the spear of Sir Pelias held, so that Sir Gawain was cast out of his saddle with terrible violence, smiting the earth with such force that he rolled thrice over in the dust, and then lay altogether motionless as though bereft of life. At this all those people upon the walls shouted with a great voice, for it was an exceedingly noble assault at arms. 
Then the four knights who stood watching that encounter made all haste unto Sir Gawain where he lay, and Sir Pelias also rode back and sat his horse nigh at hand. Then Sir Ewan and Sir Gawain's esquire unlaced the helmet of Sir Gawain with all speed, and behold, his face was the color of ashes, and they could not see that he breathed. Thereupon Sir Marhaus said, I believe that thou hast slain this knight, Sir Pelias. And Sir Pelias said, Dost thou think so? Yea, quoth Sir Marhaus, and I deem it a great pity. Unto which Sir Pelias made reply, He hath not suffered more than he deserved. At these words Sir Ewan was filled with great indignation, wherefore he cried out, Sir Knight, I think that thou forgettest the quality of this knight. For not only is he a fellow companion of the round table, to whom thou hast vowed entire brotherhood, but he is also the son of a king, and the nephew of King Arthur himself. But to this Sir Pelias maintained a very steadfast countenance, and replied, I would not repent me of this were that knight a king in his own right, instead of the son of a king. Then Sir Ewan lifted up his voice with great indignation, crying out upon Sir Pelias, Be gone, or a great ill may befall thee. Well, said Sir Pelias, I will go. Upon this he turned his horse, and rode away from that place, and entered the woodland, and so was gone from their sight. Then those others present lifted up Sir Gawain, and bare him away unto the pavilion late of Sir Pelias, and there they laid him upon the couch of Sir Pelias. But it was above an hour ere he recovered himself again, and for a great part of that while those nigh unto him believed him to have been dead. But not one of those knights wist what was the case, to wit that Sir Pelias had been so sorely wounded in the side in that encounter that it was not to be hoped that he could live for more than that day. For though the spear of Sir Gawain had burst, and though Sir Pelias had overthrown him entirely, yet the head of Sir Gawain's spear had pierced the armor of Sir Pelias, and had entered his side, and had there broken off, so that of the iron of the spear the length of the breadth of a palm had remained in the body of Sir Pelias a little above the midriff. Wherefore, while Sir Pelias sat there talking so steadfastly unto those four knights, he was yet whiles in a great passion of pain, and the blood ran down into his armour in abundance. So what with the loss of the blood, and of the great agony which he suffered, the brain of Sir Pelias swam as light as a feather all the time that he held talk with those others. But he said not a word unto them concerning the grievous wound he had received, but rode away very proudly into the forest. But when he had come into the forest, he could not forbear him any longer, but fell to groaning very sorely, crying out, Alas, alas, I have certes got my death wound in this battle. Now it chanced that morn that the damsel Parthenet had ridden forth to fly a young gerfalcon, and a dwarf belonging to the Lady Ettard had ridden with her for company. So, as the damsel and the dwarf rode through a certain part of the forest skirt, not a very great distance from Grant Menla, where the thicker part of the woodland began, and the thinner part thereof ceased, the damsel heard a voice in the woodlands lamenting with very great dolor. So she stopped and hearkened, and by and by she heard that voice again making a great moan. Then Parsonet said to the dwarf, What is that I hear? Certes it is the voice of someone in lamentation. Now let us go and see who it is that maketh such woeful moan. And the dwarf said, It shall be as thou sayest. So the damsel and the dwarf went a little way farther, and there they beheld a knight sitting upon a black horse beneath an oak tree. And that knight was clad altogether in red armor, wherefore Parsonet knew that it must be Sir Pelias. And she saw that Sir Pelias leaned with the butt of his spear upon the ground, and so upheld himself upon his horse, from which he would otherwise have fallen because of his great weakness, and all the while he made that great moan that Parsonet had heard. So, seeing him in this sorry condition, Parsonet was overcome with great pity, and she made haste to him, crying out, Alas, Sir Pelias, what ails thee? Then Sir Pelias looked at her, as though she were a great way removed from him, and because of the faintness of his soul he beheld her as it were through thin water. And he said very faintly, Maiden, I am sore hurt. Thereupon she said, How art thou hurt, Sir Pelias? And he replied, I have a grievous wound in my side, for a spear's point standeth therein nigh a palm's breadth deep, so that it reaches nearly to my heart, wherefore meseems that I shall not live for very long. Upon this the maiden cried out, Alas, alas, what is this? 
and she made great lament, and smote her hands together with sorrow that that noble knight should have come to so grievous an extremity. Then the dwarf that was with Parcenet, seeing how greatly she was distracted by sorrow, said, Damsel, I know of a certain place in this forest, albeit it is a considerable distance from this, where there dwelleth a certain very holy hermit, who is an extraordinarily skilful leech. Now when we may bring this knight unto the chapel where that hermit dwelleth, I believe that he may be greatly holpen unto health and ease again. Upon this Parsonet said, Ganseret, for Ganseret was the dwarf's name, Ganseret, let us take this knight unto that place as quickly as we are able, for I tell thee sooth when I say that I have a very great deal of love for him. Well, said the dwarf, I will show thee where that chapel is. So the dwarf took the horse of Sir Pelias by the bridle rein, and led the way through that forest. And Parsonet rode beside Sir Pelias, and upheld him upon his saddle. For some while Sir Pelias fainted with sickness and with pain, so that he would else have fallen had she not upheld him. Thus they went forward very sorrowfully, and at so slow a pace that it was noontide ere they came to that certain very dense and lonely part of the forest where the hermit abided. And when they had come unto that place, the dwarf said, Yonder, damsel, is the chapel whereof I spake. Then Parsonet lifted up her eyes, and she beheld where was a little woodland chapel built in among the leafy trees of the forest. And around this chapel was a little open lawn bedight with flowers, and nigh to the door of the hermitage was a fountain of water as clear as crystal. And this was a very secret and lonely place, and withal very silent and peaceful, for in front of the chapel they beheld a wild doe and her fawn browsing upon the tender grass and herbs without any fear of harm. And when the dwarf and the maiden and the wounded knight drew nigh, the doe and the fawn looked up with great wide eyes, and spread their large ears with wonder, yet fled not, fearing no harm, but by and by began their browsing again. Likewise, all about the chapel and the branches of the trees were great quantities of birds, singing and chirping very cheerfully, and those birds were waiting for their midday meal that the hermit was used to cast unto them. Now this was that same forest sanctuary, whereunto King Arthur had come that time when he had been so sorely wounded by Sir Pellinore, as hath been aforetold in this history. As the maiden and the dwarf and the wounded knight drew nigh to this chapel, a little bell began ringing very sweetly, so that the sound thereof echoed all through those quiet woodlands, for it was now the hour of noon. And Sir Pellias heard that bell as it were a great way off, and first he said, Whither am I come? And then he made shift to cross himself, and Parsonet crossed herself, and the dwarf kneeled down and crossed himself. Then when the bell had ceased ringing, the dwarf cried out in a loud voice, What ho, what ho, here is one needing help. Then the door of the sanctuary was opened, and there came forth from that place a very venerable man, with a long white beard, as it were, of finely carded wool. And lo, as he came forth, all those birds that waited there flew about him in great quantities, for they thought that he had come forth for to feed them. Wherefore the hermit was compelled to brush those small fowls away with his hands as he came unto where the three were stationed. And when he had come unto them, he demanded of them who they were, and why they had come thither with that wounded knight. So Parsonet told him how it was with them, and how they had found Sir Pelias so sorely wounded in the forest that morning, and had brought him hitherward. Then when the hermit had heard all of her story, he said, It is well, and I will take him in. So he took Sir Pelias into his cell, and when they had helped lay him upon the couch, Parsonet and the dwarf went their way homeward again. End of section 35 Section 36 of the story of King Arthur and his knights. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Story of King Arthur and His Knights by Howard Pyle The Book of Three Worthies, Part 2 The Story of Sir Pelias, Chapter 6, Part 2 After they had gone, the hermit examined the hurt of Sir Pelias, and Sir Pelias lay in a deep swoon, and the swoon was so deep that the hermit beheld that it was the death swoon, and that the night was nigh to his end. So he said, This knight must assuredly die in a very little while, for I can do naught to save him. Wherefore he immediately quitted the side of Sir Pelias, and set about in haste to prepare the last sacrament, 
such as might be administered unto a noble knight who was dying. Now whilst the hermit was about this business, the door opened of a sudden, and there came into that place a very strange lady, clad all in green, and to be dight around the arms, with armlets of emeralds and opal stones inset into gold. And her hair, which was very soft, was entirely black, and was tied about with a cord of crimson ribbon. And the hermit beheld that her face was like to ivory for whiteness, and that her eyes were bright like unto jewels set into ivory, wherefore he knew that she was no ordinary mortal. And this lady went straight to Sir Pelias and leaned over him so that her breath touched his forehead, and she said, Alas, Sir Pelias, that thou shouldst lie so. Lady, said the hermit, thou mayest well say, Alas, for this night hath only a few minutes to live. To this the lady said, Not so, thou holy man, for I tell thee that this night shall have a long while yet to live. And when she had said this, she stooped, and took from about his neck that necklace of emeralds and opal stones and gold that encircled it, and she hung it about her own neck. Now when the hermit beheld what she did, he said, Lady, what is this that thou doest? And why dost thou take that ornament from a dying man? But the lady made reply very tranquilly, I gave it unto him, wherefore I do but take back again what is mine own. But now I prithee let me be with this knight for a little while, for I have great hope that I may bring back life unto him again. Then the hermit was a doubt, and he said, Wilt thou endeavour to heal him by magic? And the lady said, If I do, it will not be by magic that is black. So the hermit was satisfied, and went away, and left the lady alone with Sir Pelias. Now when the lady was thus alone with the wounded knight, she immediately set about doing sundry very strange things. For first she brought forth a lodestone of great power and potency, and this she set to the wound. And lo, the iron of the spearhead came forth from the wound, and as it came Sir Pelias groaned with great passion. And when the spear-point came forth, there burst out a great issue of blood, like to a fountain of crimson. But the lady immediately pressed a fragrant napkin of fine cambric linen to the wound, and stanched the blood, and it bled no more, for she held it within the veins by very potent spells of magic. So the blood being stanched in this wise, the lady brought forth from her bosom a small crystal phial filled with an elixir of blue colour and of a very singular fragrance. And she poured some of this elixir between the cold and leaden lips of the knight, and when the elixir touched his lips, the life began to enter into his body once more. For in a little while he opened his eyes and gazed about him with a very strange look, and the first thing that he beheld was that lady, clad in green, who stood beside him. And she was so beautiful that he thought that haply he had died and was in paradise. Wherefore he said, Am I then dead? Nay, thou art not dead, said the lady. Yet hast thou been parsley nigh to death. Where then am I? said Sir Pelias. And she replied, Thou art in a deep part of the forest, and this is the cell of a saint-like hermit of the forest. At this Sir Pelias said, Who is it that hath brought me back to life? Upon this the lady smiled, and said, It was I. Now for a little while Sir Pelias lay very silent. Then by and by he spake and said, Lady, I feel very strangely. Yea, said the lady, that is because thou hast now a different life. Then Sir Pelias said, How is it with me? And the lady said, It is thus, that to bring thee back to life I gave thee to drink of a certain draught of an elixir vitae, so that thou art now only half as thou wert before. For if by the one half thou art mortal, by the other half thou art fay. Then Sir Pelias looked up, and beheld that the lady had about her neck the collar of emeralds and opal stones and gold which he had aforetime worn. And lo, his heart went out to her with exceeding ardour, and he said, Lady, thou sayest that I am half fay, and I do perceive that thou art altogether fay. Now I pray thee to let it be that henceforth I may abide nigh unto where thou art. And the lady said, It shall be as thou dost ask. For it was to that end I have suffered thee nearly to die, and then have brought thee back unto life again. And then Sir Pelias said, When may I go with thee? And she said, In a little, when thou hast had to drink. How may that be, said Sir Pelias, seeing that I am but yet like unto a little child for weakness? 
to the which the lady made reply when thou hast drunk of water thy strength shall return unto thee and thou shalt be altogether well and whole again so the lady of the lake went out and presently returned bearing in her hand an earthen crock filled with water from the fountain near at hand and when sir pelias had drunk that water he felt of a sudden his strength come altogether back to him yet he was not at all as he had been before for now his body felt as light as air and his soul was dilated with a pure joy such as he had never felt in his life before that time wherefore he immediately uprose from his couch of pain and he said thou hast given life unto me again now do i give that life unto thee for ever then the lady looked upon him and smiled with great loving kindness and she said sir pelias i have held thee in tender regard ever since i beheld thee one day in thy young knighthood drink a draught of milk at a cottager's hut in this forest for the day was warm and thou hadst set aside thy helmet and a young milkmaid brown of face and with bare feet came and brought thee a bowl of milk which same thou didst drink of with great appetite that was the first time that i beheld thee although thou didst not see me since that time i have had great friendship for all thy fellowship of king arthur's court and for king arthur himself all for thy sake then sir pelias said lady wilt thou accept me for thy knight and she said i then sir pelias said may i salute thee and she said yea if it pleasures thee so sir pelias kissed her upon the lips and so their troth was plighted now return we unto parcenet and the dwarf after those two had left that hermitage in the woodland they betook their way again toward grant Menle. and when they had come nigh out of the forest at a place not far from the glade of trees wherein those knights companion had taken up their inn they met one of those knights clad in half armour and that knight was sir mado de la porte then parcenet called upon him by name saying alas sir mador i have but this short time quitted a hermit's cell in the forest where i left sir pelias sorely wounded to death so i fear me he hath only a little while to live then sir mador de la porte cried out ha maiden what is this thou tellest me that is a very hard thing to believe for when sir pelias quitted us this morn he gave no sign of wound or disease of any sort but parcenet replied Nevertheless, I myself beheld him lying in great pain and dole, and ere he swooned his death swoon, he himself told me that he had the iron of a spear in his side. Then Sir Mador de la Porte said, Alas, alas, that is sorry news. Now, damsel, by thy leave and grace, I will leave thee and hasten to my companions to tell them this news. And Parsonet said, I prithee do so so sir mador de la porte made haste to the pavilion where were his companions and he told them the news that he had heard now at this time sir gawain was altogether recovered from the violent overthrow he had suffered that morning wherefore when he heard the news that sir mador de la porte brought to him he smote his hands together and cried out aloud woe is me what have i done for first i betrayed my friend and now i have slain him now i will go forth straightway to find him and to crave his forgiveness ere he die but sir ewan said what is this that thou wouldst do thou art not yet fit to undertake any journey sir gawain said i care not for i am determined to go and find my friend nor would he suffer any of his companions to accompany him but when he had summoned his esquire to bring him his horse he mounted thereon and rode away into the forest alone betaking his way to the westward and lamenting with great sorrow as he journeyed forward now when the afternoon had fallen very late so that the sun was sloping to its setting and the light fell as red as fire through the forest leaves sir gawain came to that hermit's cell where it stood in the silent and solitary part of the forest woodland and he beheld that the hermit was outside of his cell digging in a little garden of lintels so when the hermit saw the armed knight come into that lawn all in the red light of the setting sun he stopped digging and leaned upon his trowel then Sir Gawain drew nigh, and as he sat upon his horse, he told the holy man of the business whereon he had come. To this the hermit said, There came a lady hither several hours ago, and she was clad all in green, and was of a very singular appearance, so that it was easy to see that she was fay. And by means of certain charms of magic that lady cured thy friend, and after she had healed him, the two rode away into the forest together. 
Then Sir Gawain was very much amazed, and he said, This is a very strange thing that thou tellest me, that a knight who is dying should be brought back to life again in so short a time, and should so suddenly ride forth from a bed of pain. Now I prithee tell me whither they went. The hermit said, They went to the westward. Whereupon, when Sir Gawain heard this, he said, I will follow them. So he rode away, and left the hermit gazing after him. And as he rode forward upon his way, the twilight began to fall apace, so that the woodlands after a while grew very dark and strange all around him. But as the darkness descended, a very singular miracle happened, for lo, there appeared before Sir Gawain a light of a pale blue color, and it went before him and showed him the way, and he followed it much marveling. Now after he had followed that light for a very long time, he came at last of a sudden to where the woodland ceased, and where there was a wide open plain of very great extent. And this plain was all illuminated by a singular radiance, which was like that of a clear full moonlight, albeit no moon was shining at that time. And in that pale and silver light Sir Gawain could see everything with wonderful distinctness, Wherefore he beheld that he was in a plain covered all over with flowers of divers sorts, the odours whereof so filled the night that it appeared to press upon the bosom with a great pleasure. And he beheld that in front of him lay a great lake very wide and still, and all those things appeared so strange in that light that Sir Gawain wotted that he had come into a land of fairy. So he rode among tall flowers toward that lake in a sort of fear, for he wist not what was to befall him. Now as he drew near the lake, he perceived a knight and a lady approaching him. And when they had come nigh, he beheld that the knight was Sir Pelleas, and that his countenance was exceedingly strange. And he beheld that the lady was she whom he had aforetime seen all clad in green apparel, when he had travelled in the forest of adventure with Sir Ewen and Sir Marhaus. Now when Sir Gawain first beheld Sir Pelleas, he was filled with a great fear, for he thought it was a spirit that he saw. But when he perceived that Sir Pelleas was alive, there came into his bosom a joy as great as that fear had been. Wherefore he made haste toward Sir Pelleas, and when he had come near to Sir Pelleas, he leaped from off his horse, crying out, Forgive, forgive, with great vehemence of passion. Then he would have taken Sir Pelleas into his arms, but Sir Pelleas withdrew himself from the contact of Sir Gawain, though not with any violence of anger. And Sir Pelleas spake in a voice very thin, and of a silvery clearness, as though it came from a considerable distance. And he said, Touch me not, for I am not as I was aforetime, being not all human, but part fay. But concerning my forgiveness, I do forgive thee whatsoever injury I may have suffered at thy hands. And more than this I give unto thee my love, and I greatly hope for thy joy and happiness. But now I go away to leave thee, dear friend, and haply I shall not behold thee again, wherefore I do leave this with thee as my last behest, to wit that thou dost go back to King Arthur's court, and make thy peace with the queen, so thou mayest bring them news of all that hath happened unto me. Then Sir Gawain cried out in great sorrow, Whither wouldst thou go? And Sir Pelleas said, I shall go to yonder wonderful city of gold and azure, which lieth in yonder valley of flowers. Then Sir Gawain said, I see no city, but only a lake of water. Whereupon Sir Pelleas replied, Ne'ertheless there is a city yonder, and thither I go, wherefore I do now bid thee farewell. Then Sir Gawain looked into the face of Sir Pelleas, and beheld again that strange light, that it was of a very singular appearance. For lo, it was white like to ivory, and his eyes shone like jewels set in ivory, and a smile lay upon his lips, and grew neither more nor less, but always remained the same. For those who were of that sort had always that singular appearance, and smiled in that manner. To it the Lady of the Lake, and Sir Pelleas, and Sir Lancelot of the Lake. Then Sir Pelleas and the Lady of the Lake turned and left Sir Gawain where he stood, and they went toward the lake, and they entered the lake, and when the feet of the horse of Sir Pelleas had touched the water of the lake, lo, Sir Pelleas was gone, and Sir Gawain beheld him no more, although he stood there for a long time weeping with great passion. So endeth the story of Sir Pelleas.
but Sir Gawaine returned unto the court of King Arthur as he had promised Sir Pelias to do, and he made his peace with Queen Guinevere, and thereafter, though the Queen loved him not, yet there was a peace betwixt them. And Sir Gawain published these things to the court of King Arthur, and all men marvelled at what he told. And only twice thereafter was Sir Pelias ever seen of any of his aforetime companions. And Sir Marhaus was made a companion of the round table, and became one of the foremost knights thereof. And the Lady Ettard took Sir Engamore into favour again, and that summer they were wedded, and Sir Engamore became lord of Grant Menle. So endeth this story. End of section 36